Broadcasting from their world headquarters in Texas, it's the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show. The show that discusses arcade repair, restoration, news, and more. Now, here are your hosts, Tim and Jonathan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show for January 2021. Tim, we're finally out of 2020. Who would have thought? But anyway, guys, thanks for joining us tonight for episode 47. My name is Jonathan Leung, the producer, director, and editor of the Arcade Repair Tips video series. And joining me today, as always, is Mr. Arcade Repair Tips himself, Tim Peterson. Tim, how you doing? Well, I'm doing okay, Jonathan. I don't know about 2021 is not off to a great start. I, I think I, my test, if the test subscription is over, I just want to go ahead and uh, start back over again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, it, you know, I think somebody posted that it's uh, December thirty seventh, twenty twenty, still or something to that effect. So I mean, yeah, we may still be there, Tim. But uh, it is good to have a new year, regardless of if it's kind of a continuation of last year a little bit. But um, hopefully, this will be looking better for us and for y'all. But we want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Hopefully, Tim, we can kind of take everybody's mind off some of the insanity that has taken place over the last couple of days. And guys, that's what we are here. We like to be a respite from some of that stuff. Um, if if you want to hear us talk about it, we'll probably talk about it a little bit in the after show if you guys want to stick around for that. But, uh, Tim, other than all the craziness that's been going on in the nation, how are you doing? Oh, I'm pretty good. Just um, working a lot of hours. Um, we are still busy, uh, which is good. Uh, good for uh, at least my economy, you know, is doing okay. Uh, and still able to go to work every day, so I'm thankful for that. But, uh, you know, it takes a toll on an old man having to get up and go to work work with them long hours. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how early you have to wake up, Tim. What time do you usually get up to a typical Dairy Queen store when you have to work there? I get up around 4.55 a.m., and that's just enough time to throw my clothes on and go uh, to be there at 6. Uh, some mornings I go in and start at 5 o'clock, so I have to leave about 3.55 yeah, I mean, that's way too early, Tim. That's an hour, at least an hour earlier than I wake up, and <laughs> I think I wake up early. So um, I'm <laughs> I'm glad I don't have your schedule, but I still, you know, I usually get off a little earlier, don't you? Um, well, because don't of that. Until 5 o'clock. Okay. You know, you know, our shift. Our shift. Ah, golly, that's a long one. Uh, but hopefully you're raking in some good overtime. Are you working more to, than 40 hours right now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 55, 55 hours, hours is my, my schedule work week. Gotcha. Oh, golly, that's a lot. Well, it's a job, like you said. Thankful to have it. I understand that. Okay. So I'm glad to I'm glad to hear that everything else is going good. And Tim, obviously, we hope everybody had a good Christmas, good New Year's. And another thing, probably we'll talk about more in the after show. Tim, it's some of the stuff you may have gotten for Christmas. Of course, everybody saw us uh, open up our presents here on the live show. But um, for for those of you who want to know uh, some of the other things we got, we'll talk about that in the after show. But Tim, before we go on, I do want to remind everybody that we have our live chat this evening that they can interact with the show through. And Tim, I've got uh, YouTube Punk says he's here. But he's got a weird schedule. Not sure if he's going to be around long. But as always, Tim, we're always glad to have you here, YouTube Punk. Uh, the Vintage Tech Guy is here. We got The Real Hammer Billy Lee is here. Michael Bloom is here, Tim. So we got a lot of the regulars here for the live show. We're so glad you guys can join us. What was that, Tim? I'm noticing a lot of familiar names, guys. Thank y'all for coming or being here. Oh, yeah, repeat viewers, Tim. That's what it's all about, right? Like having people come back after you've already been here. We love that. So uh, we're so glad that you guys are here and watching us tonight. Hopefully, like I said, we can we can have a little fun, answer some arcade repair questions, and uh, and just hang out, right? Talk arcade games. That's what we like to do here. So, Tim, uh, before we before we move on, I will also um, I will also mention here that I am wearing my new Game Preserve shirt, which is just like the one I got you. But I just recently ordered this. Uh, Tim, we posted on our Facebook page, and we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, more in in the uh, further in the show. But uh, they're trying to reach a goal right now, and they're trying to raise money, and they're so close. They're only, I think they only have ten percent more. Uh, to their goal in order to reach it. And so if you guys want to support the Game Preserve, of course, Tim, you know, that's Rusty and Eric, along with several of our other friends who run the Game Preserve. And so, you know, we highly recommend that you go there, support them. That's the GamePreserveHouston.com. Tim, I ordered the shirt like I got you, and I also ordered us both coffee mugs. Um, Tim, mine doesn't have coffee in it, but I'm going to let uh, all those people in the live chat decide what's in it. How about that? It is, it is after, after 5, five o'clock here. here. I'm just saying. Saying. And it's always 5 o'clock somewhere, Tim. That's all. all, right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I got to say. So anyway, guys, uh, we hope that we find you well tonight, and we look forward to answering some arcade repair questions with you. So, Tim, uh, just a couple of comments about waking up early since you mentioned that. 
YouTube Punk says, uh, 5 a.m. Oy vey. He says that's way too early, apparently, for him. Michael Bloom says, my alarm goes off at 5.10 to be at work at 6. So, you see, he he's you're more on my schedule, Michael. That's closer to the time. I, I wake up about 5.30, 5.45. Uh, let's see. <laughs> oh, somebody says, let me buy your Miss Pack cabinet. Unfortunately, it's not for sale, Tim. I do have one in storage, though. If I could ever get that thing actually restored, I may sell. Uh, mm -hmm. Tim's been trying to talk me out of it for a while now. But, you know, Tim, with the prices of... Art, of classic arcade cabinets going up so much, I just hate to sell anything right now, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Where am I going to find another Miss Pack? Uh, that uh, might be one. one. Oh, that's true, but I mean, there's something about a cabinet that was in the arcade at one time. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Oh, mine, mine came, came from, from Dairy Queen. Queen. So oh, that's I, right. That's cool. cool. It was in a Dairy Queen, Queen at one, one time. time. Yeah, and uh, I did a big trade where, um, actually a big buy, and Tim was there with me, where I purchased three games, an Asteroids that did Asteroids and Asteroids Deluxe, a Galaga, and a um, Night Drive and Pinball Machine, uh, or, um, uh, what is it? oh, the Sega one, I can't, it's not, it's Night, Viper Night Drive, and that's what it is. Uh, and those three had also come out of a Dairy Queen at one time, remember that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember, I remember that. that. And a Pac-Man Cabaret, which I still have the Pac-Man Cabaret and the Galaga, but I no longer have the uh, the Asteroids or the Night Drive, uh, the, the Viper Night Drive. And Tim, that Asteroids, though, was one of the most beautiful Asteroids I'd ever seen. I, it broke my heart to to, uh, to sell it, but Tim, I wouldn't have been able to get my X-Men pinball machine without it, so. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. true. It was part of the trade, so it is what it is. You do what you do. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, Tim, let's go ahead and get into some arcade re repair-related questions for this show. And Tim, the first one I have here is from Rick. So let's go ahead and read Rick's question real quick. Hi, Tim. I have a Defender slash Defender 2 stand-up machine with a few problems. First, the CRT tube is cracked at the neck. The anode cup was disconnected as well, so I have not powered it up. I'm wondering if the glass tube is cracked... Uh, I'm wondering if the glass tube that is cracked is a no-go for the CRT tube to function properly. Does this mean that I need to replace the monitor? By the way, thank you for your excellent video channel on YouTube. Sincerely, Rick. So, Tim, uh, this is a pretty common thing that happens from time to time where you get, uh, you accidentally crack the neck on your CRT tube. Uh, Tim, we've had this happen to us before. Typically, it's because... Of, uh, we didn't take off the back door properly. Seems to be a, a pretty good fault. Or for some reason, the back door did not slide in properly whenever we put it on. It seems like the back door a lot of times will hit the back of that neck and crack it. And so, Tim, obviously an issue that we're familiar with. But what do you think Rick needs to do in order to get his Defender slash Defender 2 back up and running? Well, well like, like I said, John, so we, we are familiar, familiar with, with his plight. plight. Um, and in every, every instance that we've ever had, had we've had, had to replace, replace the tube or the monitor, monitor, the whole monitor at this point. point. Um, um, you know, you know and, and, that's and that's hard to do because most of the time we're always trying to repair, 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 repair. We don't know anything, anything that can fix the glass or any way, way that's possible. possible. Uh, uh, if, if it is, it's it probably be so expensive that it wouldn't be worth it. I mean, you can get a donor tube, you know, or we we've got. I know on our page we talk about that where you can find tubes and stuff. So you don't have to replace the whole chassis, just the tube part of it. But that can be difficult too. So, you know, depending on his level of skill or the time that he has or the even availability of a donor tube, um, he may just have to replace it. And unfortunately, today's times, that may have to be with an LCD monitor. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, somebody was saying that you had a little funky sound there, Tim. Uh, sorry about that, guys. I forgot to turn off. Um, I have the desktop audio, and I also have Tim's audio. And I have to turn on the desktop audio in order to play the, the intro sound. But sometimes if I leave that on, we'll get some funky feedback. So Tim should be fixed on the echo guys sorry about that up front uh but um sorry about that little issue but tim you're exactly right i mean here you're probably looking at a monitor replacement now you could do a tube swap correct yeah so you could go ahead we had them before and uh you know there's depending like i said even those are getting hard to find these days just old tubes are getting hard to find absolutely but you know if you dig around at your local junkyard find a donor tube from a tv tim there are some places where you can go to uh to find those and so tim unfortunately i did not put any of the links in the show notes for today um but we will have them here during the show so hopefully you guys can can do that and uh and uh, check it out. But uh, Tim, I'm just going to go ahead and throw the slide up here because it pretty much says what you already you already mentioned here. Yeah, based on your description, it sounds like you will need to replace the tube in order to get the monitor working again. And Tim, I do reference the donor tube list on uh, junknet.net that we've talked about before, Tim, and there's also a link to that if you want to use that. Tim, that is by no means a comprehensive list of donor tubes. There, you can use, as long as the, the, um, 
As long as the yoke settings are the same, you can pretty much use any tube. And as long as the neck board fits, as we've talked about, uh, you can use that tube. But uh, those are the two things you want to check. You want to check the tube. You want to check the uh, the neck board. Make sure that those fit. And like, like Tim mentioned, though, finding donor tubes can be difficult depending on where you're located. So it may be better to go with an LCD monitor replacement. Um, so just make sure that you go with something that's a commercial grade arcade quality one that supports the 15 kilohertz signal, Tim. Uh, a lot of vendors sell those, um, including Suzo Hap or Twisted Quarter or any, a lot of the uh, different ones that we recommend, right, Tim? Correct. Yeah, so, not, yeah I mean, yeah, they're, they're, very, they're very easy to get. So, I mean, if you're looking at that. Now, Tim, I don't know which Defender slash Defender 2 he has because I know that Team Play made one, right? The same people who make the, uh, the little three-in-one centipede with centipede, let's go, bowling, and millipede, right? Yes, and that's what I was thinking. It may be a, a newer version of that game. So uh, it may not, uh, you know, may be easier actually to put an LCD in there. Exactly. So it just depends on, on really uh, what your cabinet is. And Tim, I've also seen people who have, of course, uh, kind of made their own Defender slash Defender 2 uh, versions. So it really depends on kind of what you're working with there. But more than likely, Tim, it is going to be using the standard 15 kilohertz signal. So any LCD monitor that supports that or... A lot of times you'll see it as CGA if you're looking for LCD monitors. Any CGA monitor that you're looking for should support that resolution and allow you to, to use it in your cabinet. Tim, is there anything else you have for Rick before we move on? I don't think so. Good luck, Rick. So um, please let us know how, what you ended up doing. Sounds good. So, Rick, hopefully that answers your question. And good luck getting your Defender slash Defender 2 back up and running and tim yeah a cracked neck on a on a monitor tube is just such a <laughs> it's such a deflating moment especially if you witness it uh, oh my goodness it, it just it'll break your heart for sure yeah <laughs> so um but hopefully he can like, get it back up and running what do you say tim like, it's like the blue screen of death on the windows 95 or something yeah you know you can still get a blue screen even now tim in a windows 10 but i will say that windows 10 is much more resilient than windows 95 or 98 used to be back in the day um but yeah i think that's a, an apt comparison is to say basically like getting a blue screen of death this is kind of the same thing so uh but rick good luck with your repair and please let us know if you have any additional questions about that monitor swap if it, you, whether you go with a tube swap or you go with a full-on monitor swap so Okay, we've got a couple of things here, Tim. Uh, Danny says, Happy New Year, guys. Enjoy seeing you again. I uh, hope both of your families are fine and safe. Same to you, Danny. Hopefully you had, hopefully you had a great uh, New Year's Eve and all that kind of stuff. Tim, just a little respite here. Um, how was your New Year's Eve? It was good. Um, we have my wife, you know, being a teacher, she has uh, teacher friends, and they invite just a, another couple invited us over, and we played some cards. And, uh, you know, all of us are old, so we barely made it past New Year's, but we did. <laughs> and then made it home safely, easily, and uh, got to sleep in a little the next day. So it was good. It was just plain and simple. Watch the ball drop a little bit, and that was about it. You know, um, for us, it was pretty much the same. We stayed here at home. We didn't go anywhere. Uh, we actually had the exact same New Year's Eve that we had last year. Um, and I know that's kind of funny, but... Um, Last year, um, same as this year, my daughter got a whole bunch of Lego sets. And so New Year's Eve, New Year's Day are kind of like the days that we go and put those Lego sets together. So um, this year, I promised her we would do, uh, she got a big amusement park. And so we put together a big a big amusement park Lego set. Uh, but she, she loves doing that. It's kind of like putting together puzzles or, or playing games even, Tim. You know, the Lego sets today are amazing. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Michael Bloom says, I broke down and installed an LCD in my Killer Instinct 2 despite the purest in me. Uh, screaming. As soon as I fired it up, I knew I made the right decision. <laughs> yeah, guys, CRT monitors are harder to find. I mean, now, KI-2 is a 25-inch, and you can find some CRT 25, 27-inches, Tim, new, but they're expensive, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're going to replace it with a new one, especially, and finding used ones, depending on your area, is tough. Sometimes, guys, you just have to bite the bullet and go LCD. Tim, Everything in my game room, except for one, is, is CRT. I'm hoping I can continue that way, but uh, you just never know when these things are going to go. And once that tube is gone, finding a donor tube, especially now, is a lot tougher than it used to be. So, Yeah, I think so. There you go. Uh, let's see. Mr. Dwayne 79 is here, too. He says, hey, guys. So there you go, Ted. Hey, Dwayne. So there we go. So, uh, again, guys, we're so glad to have you here with us tonight. And uh, just make sure that you uh, leave some, uh, you know, uh, some comments, questions in the live chat if you have anything for us, Tim. Do you have a question you'd like to pose to the live chat tonight, Tim? I'm just curious. Um, oh, that's a good a good question there. I guess, you know, um, 
you know, do you see yourself um, buying more games in the next year, or is it, has stuff tightened, you know, everybody, I think, is feeling a little financial strain, whether you've worked all year or not, um, so, you know, I kind of see myself as um, maybe just appreciating what I have in my collection and working on it. That's, that's kind of my goal of 2021. Uh, what about you guys in the live chat? Do y'all foresee buying more games or kind of, I'm in the mode of fixing what I got this year, kind of. I like the, I like the question saying like, what are your arcade goals for 2021? Is that a good way to say it? Yeah. So there you go. So, uh, if you guys have arcade goals for 2021, let us know what they are in the live chat this evening. So, Okay, Tim, let us continue on with our, with our questions, and the next one is from Gus. And Gus says, Hi, I'm looking for opinions, please. I have a Robotron, and the left joystick won't go left sometimes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it gets stuck, and won't go left. The robot won't move in the left direction. Any idea what the issue could be? I bought a new joystick from eBay, so I'm hoping that'll fix the issue. But until I receive it, I thought I'd ask you. So, Tim, we've got Gus here. He's got a Robotron, one of our favorite Williams games. It's a fun one to play. And so it seems like it's playing well. Everything's working with it, except sometimes he can't move left with it. So what do you think's going on uh, with Gus's machine here? What do you think he needs to do in order to get it working? Well, you know, John, I really like to watch guys who are good at Robotron. I'm not one of them, um, but I like to watch people who are good. And when I watch people who are good play or even halfway decent, those joysticks take a pounding. <laughs> you know, it's one of those games where you're really playing around with those joysticks. So it's very common for one of the, the for it to just to wear out. So it may be time just to replace the joystick, and that should take care of this problem. Now, anytime we're having one particular joystick movement, uh, in his case, I believe it was going left. Um, you can check that switch and make sure that the leaf switch is, sometimes you can adjust it or you can just replace that one individual switch or a lot of times it's just a wiring to it. You know, we were building new games uh, a lot last year and uh, so, I'm sorry, let me tell this person, whoever's calling me, <laughs> I think that was, um, I, I really need to call them about my car insurance, but you know, <laughs> it's not my car warranty, but we're going to have to save that to another time. Um, anyway, um, when we were building those new games, man, I can't tell you how many times we had one that wouldn't go, and we just didn't crimp the wires good to it, or it come unplugged, or a lot of times it was a grounding issue. So, of course, he wants to check his wiring, too, but at some point, uh, especially if you can get similar or reproduction joysticks. Uh, if you're very good at playing that game or you're going to play it a lot, kind of like our friend Steve and his Burger Time joystick, you might as well just keep one on hand because that dude can wear out a joystick over a year's time. Absolutely. Now, Tim, the only thing about Robotron is they use those eight-way Leaf Wicko joysticks, which are hard to come by, like to get that exact one. Now, you can find eight-way Leaf joysticks, but many of the Robotron players that I've talked to say that if it's not the Wicko, it's not the same. And I so, that. yeah, and so that's the only thing I think about going with the replacement here, Gus, is that it may not play quite as good as that Wicko. But Tim, like you mentioned, he could maybe slightly adjust the leaf switch and maybe just bring in that outside terminal a little bit closer so that makes better contact. Or it could be a wiring issue. Obviously, we've seen that before where ground wire falls off of a, a switch or even the switch wire falls off. And so um, it may not be, a, a total replacement may not be needed. He says he's already bought one, so it's fine. I mean, if you want to replace it, I'm just letting you know that the gameplay of the new joystick may not match the gameplay of the original joystick. And if you have two that play differently, I could see that being a little bit of uh, adjustment. What about you? Yeah, I can believe that. Uh, but at the same time, like you're saying, uh, the fact it works sometimes and sometimes doesn't makes me feel like maybe it just needs an adjustment or it's a wiring issue. So hopefully there is some fix there before we go total replacement route. Sounds good. So, Tim, I'm going to throw up the slide here for, for Gus. Uh, from your description, it does sound like either a joystick or wiring issue. So there's a good chance that replacing your joystick will solve the problem. If the problem lingers after the joystick replacement, inspect your connectors and wiring from the joystick switch to the main board. With that... Don't say, be back. What'd you say? A, I do need to get this call. I will be back. Okay. I'll finish up this okay. one, and then we'll go to the live chat for a bit. Okay. Um, okay. 
With that said, it could be that the leaf switches just need to be adjusted a bit on your current joystick. Sometimes the leaf switches will become misaligned over time, causing them to not register properly. Tim mentioned that when um, good Robotron players are on the machine, typically they beat up those joysticks really good. So over time, those leaf switches may become slightly misaligned. Um, a small modification with some needle nose pliers may help in this case. So if this is you, you may just need to bend in those um, those, le those uh, leaf switch terminals just a bit to in, in order for them to touch a little bit better whenever you press that left direction. It happens, like I said. Uh, but if you do the joystick replacement and you're happy with it, you should be fine. So um, guys, hopefully that answers your question and good luck uh, with the Robotron joysticks uh, or replacing the Robotron joystick or adjusting it depending on what you decide to do. Okay, so I lost Tim for a second. I don't know what Tim's background is. I saw that um, I, I saw that uh, YouTube Punky said that it looks like a bus. I don't know. I'll ask him when he comes back. Now, Wasteland Warrior asked, "How can I use a pin or can I use a pin shaker motor in my Williams Roadshow?" Not for sure about that. Um, I would probably contact like Pinball Life or somebody like that who sells those and ask them if it was going to be compatible. Uh, unfortunately, we don't work on as many pinball machines as we used to, especially not older ones anymore. And so I don't know if offhand they're going to be compatible with each other. But like I said, if you contact the, whoever the parts distributor that you want to buy it from is and ask them, a lot of times they'll be able to let you know. Because, I mean, here's the deal. Parts distributors, guys, want to sell you parts. And so if they know that, you know, they'll find out if something's compatible because they want to sell it to you. So it may not be a bad idea, Wasteland Warrior, to go ahead and contact somebody, uh, whoever you're looking at buying the part from. I don't know who, if that's Marco or Pinball Life or whoever that is. Just contact them and ask them, hey, can I use can I use my um, th this shaker motor in my uh, roadshow? And I'm sure they can let you know. So, yeah, I guess Tim's always on duty. I don't know if this is a Dairy Queen related call or not. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll find out, I'm sure, when he gets back. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, Tim posed a question to you guys in the live chat about uh, arcade goals for 2021, if you guys had any. I don't know. I don't plan on any, on buying anything personally this year, but I did see that Arcade 1-Up's going to be announcing some new cabinets. And um, last year I did buy the Golden Tee. I think that was the only one I purchased last year was the Golden Tea Cabinet. I've been very happy with the Golden Tea Cabinet. Uh, it's actually sitting right here. You guys can't see it, but um, it's a it's actually a very well-designed cabinet. It plays well. People come over, they play it. Uh, we've had no issues out of it. So I may end up buying another Arcade 1-Up depending on what they release. Um, I like the NBA Jam cabinet that they had. I thought that was cool looking. Uh, and the, the Ninja Turtles cabinet was really great. I don't know if we're going to see repros of those at any point. But I don't know what the release schedule is looking like right now. But we'll find out. With CES coming up, I'm sure we're going to get some announcements soon. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael says, I found that gently running some fine grit sandpaper through the leaf contacts can remove oxidation. That will make the switch a little more responsive. That is correct. Something that we did not mention, thank you, Michael, for that, is that you can run some some uh, fine grit sandpaper between the contacts. A lot of times that will um, that'll give them just enough uh, of... Um, It'll, it'll put just enough abrasiveness on there to clean those contacts to where they make a little bit better connection. So that may be another way you want to go, Gus, um, rather than replacing it like we talked about. Um, let's see. Uh, Danny says, YouTube Punk, I feel like you had a cruising world for a while or need another board. Um, oh, YouTube Punk also reminds us that Matty Mo's Arcade is having a contest to win a free cap kit. And uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Matt uh, does a, a great job with his YouTube channel. Uh, Maddie Moe's Arcade. So if you haven't visited that and you're into arcade repair and restoration stuff, you should definitely check out his YouTube channel as well. Uh, great content there. There's so many great arcade channels here on YouTube. So I hope that uh, you're taking in more than just us and you're checking out some of the others as well because there's a lot of great content out there if you're interested in arcade repair. Uh, let's see. Where can I get a two 1911 pistols for a Lethal Enforcer's cabinet? If you're looking for the originals, I'm not sure if anybody makes the original repro Lethal Enforcers guns anymore. A lot of times I see them now, they have the standard issue HAP guns. And so if you're looking for the original Lethal Enforcers guns, you're probably going to have to look to some arcade forums to see if there's some people who have them used out there. But the the HAP guns, the standard HAP light guns should work with Lethal Enforcers. You may need an adapter kit in order to get them to plug in directly. I'm not for sure on that. But I've seen many Lethal Enforcers now that are using standard HAP guns over using the um, original Lethal Enforcers guns. So, again, I don't know if there's anyone who's reproing those uh, Lethal Enforcers guns right now. Um, more than likely, you're going to have to find somebody who's got them lying around used or new old stock or something. So, 
Uh, yeah, and uh, YouTube Pump mentions Arcade Boneyard. Maybe a good place to check out if you're looking for used parts there, for sure. Uh, that's uh, Cisco Malo. So, uh, yeah, you might try that. So, and David says, Happy New Year, Jonathan. Happy New Year, David. How's it going? I'm sitting here killing time while I'm waiting for Tim to come back. I could technically do another question without Tim, but, um, you know, I feel bad about that. I like having him here. Uh, maybe I should do this next one, though, because this involves the 412 in one uh, board with the Game Elf board that a lot of you guys are familiar with. And so I tell you what, I'm just going to move on without Tim. We're going to, we'll uh, do one question without him, and that way we don't, we're not here all night killing time before he gets here. And so here's a question from Jamie, guys. And he says, great sight. I've been spending some time on there. I have a 60-in-1 JAMA board in my Multicade from 2007. I want to move up to a 412-in-1 Game Elf. I have a trackball. I don't want to mess around with cutting harnesses. So here are my questions. Will a JAMA JAMA adapter allow me to plug the 412 and not cut wires? Will I need a trackball rewire set? Is there anything else I might need? Do you sell the equipment? And if not... Can you point me to the correct site? Seriously, I thank you in advance for your help, Jamie. So, guys, we have Jamie here, and Jamie's having some problems. Uh, well, they're not problems, really. He wants to move up to the 412-in-1 game elf board from his 60-in-1. So this is something we get a lot. We actually did a, actually I did a video on it because we had a customer who was wanting to move up to that 412 and one. Of course, the 412 and one gives you a lot more games, which is what most people who are doing this mod want. They want just more games than the 60 in one gives you. To be honest with you, I love the 60 in one because it does give you, I feel like, the best selection of classic games. But the 412 in one is also a good board too. Here's the thing though, Jamie, I don't know of an adapter board that's, or any kind of adapter that you can buy that's going to allow you to just plug and play the 412 in one into the 60 in one. I, you could probably make one, uh, but um, I don't know of anything that will allow you to do that. Because there's a couple of modifications you have to make in order to get the 412 in one board to work in a 60 in one wired cabinet. And the two biggest things are the trackball wiring. Now, the 60 in one does have an actual. Um, connector for the trackball, but a lot of the 16-in-1 cabinets I've seen have the trackball wired to the player 2 controls so that they don't have to use the um, connector on the board. And depending on how yours is wired now, you may you may be hooked up to that connector or you may be hooked up to the player 2 controls. But I don't think the 412-in-1 supports the trackball being hooked up to the player 2 controls. So at any rate, you're going to have to cut those wires off of off of the harness in order to hook it up to the trackball port on the 412-in-1. Also, the 412-in-1 does not like it when we have the ground on pin 27 of the of the JAMA harness. And a lot of 16-1s, they'll wire it up like that because I believe that's what the standard JAMA wiring is. They'll go ahead and, and have a ground there at pin 27. So more than likely, you will have to cut that ground off in order to work in order to get to work with the 412-in-1 board. So those are two wiring modifications that have to be made in order to get the 412 in one board working in a 16-in-1 wired cabinet. So there's really not a plug-and-play solution that's not going to requires some rewiring uh and like i said depending on where your trackball is wired you're going you're going to have to cut it pretty much because i don't think that the adapters on the 16 one board the trackball adapters are the same as the ones on the 412 in one they may slip in there never tried that before if it's the connector but there is a, a trackball harness for the 412 in one that you'll probably need to wire into for your trackball so you will need the 412 in one harness uh trackball adapter which holland computers has unfortunately i did not link to it but uh, i'll put it in the show notes after the fact for you jamie so you can find it so more than likely to do this you're gonna have to cut pin 27 off of your jamma harness so that it's not connected to ground anymore and then you're gonna have to figure out how to rewire your trackball in order to connect it to the 412 in one so those are the two hurdles you'll have to come up you'll have to you'll have to uh, jump over in order to get this working and i'm just going to go ahead and show the uh, slide here so you guys can see it so we don't as i mentioned we don't know of an adapter that you can buy that will allow you to use a 412 in one board in a cabinet that's wired for the 60 in one without at least some modifications while most of the wiring is the same between the two two boards i mean they're both technically jamma boards but there are some slight modifications. The biggest changes being that the trackball wiring and making sure the pin 27 is not connected to ground. Second one is super easy because you just cut it and you're fine. And when I say cut it, guys, make sure that you cut it and then wrap it. So, uh, and you can do that with just electrical tape or something else, just kind of wrap it around there and be fine. Um, you just don't want that wire exposed very much just in case it does, uh, it does um, touch something else because a floating ground 
could uh, obviously short something if it touches something. So at least wrap it with some electrical tape or something to make sure that after you cut it, it's not going to touch anything. So again, the first one though is a bit more difficult depending on how they wired up the trackball, whether it's wired up to the connector on the 16 one board or whether it's wired up to the player two controls. Regardless, you will need the trackball harness in order to hook it up to the 412 and one board. And, and as we talked about, uh, you can get that harness from Holland Computers and Jamie, I will send a link to you or I'll put a link in the show notes for you so you can get that that um, harness but you will need that and it's going to require probably some splicing of wires on your part it's not hard you're just going to have to match up the voltages in the grounds and the um, the, the uh, positions but it's really not that bad you should be able to do it and if you have any questions about how to wire that up you can contact us and we'll try to help you out some more so jamie hopefully the answer answers your question and good luck with your good luck with your uh, repair on your 412 or upgrading your 16 to a 412 in one and tim he's back Right. I took a whole question without you. <laughs> well, sorry about that, Johnson. Just to let everybody know that was a... And, and you know, is everybody like this? When you see a call from New Jersey, you're thinking spam, warranty, something. That was actually the drill instructor from San Diego. Landon, uh, as you guys might know, is in Marine Boot Camp. And we can't talk to him at all. But he won a contest today in a four-minute phone call. Wow. So I've not heard from him since uh, October 27th. I heard his voice at all. We didn't get to hear from him on Christmas or anything. So sorry, guys. I needed to take a four-minute phone call. But I am back and uh, glad to hear from Landon, although... His mother is going to be really disappointed. She missed it. So. Well, at least if you're going to miss part of the show, I'm glad you have a good story to make up for it. So there you go. And that's definitely a good story there. So I, I don't think anybody anybody uh, uh, begrudges you missing a little bit of the show for that. It's definitely a very important call to take. So now we had some chat while I was doing the um, while I was doing the last question, Tim. <laughs> YouTube Punk says we'll do it live. I'm not quite a Bill O'Reilly like uh, I, I thought. I was pretty calm considering the situation, Tim. So I wasn't like we'll do it live, you know, or anything like that. So, yeah. um, but anyway, okay. uh, Danny says, I agree with Tim. Got three projects right now in my Golden T Cruising World and Z back Neo Geo. So he's going to be fixing up some projects, Tim. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Joe Flores says, I have a 1981 Tato Space Invaders. During gameplay, when the game gets jolted, I hear the sound of an invader being destroyed. Um, with the service door removed, I can gently tap on the outermost part of the PCB and the sound of the invader uh, destroys being heard. This only happens during gameplay. So, Tim, these um, Space Invaders PCBs, you really need to take them out and clean them big time, right? Yeah. Yeah, so like all of the edge connections and all the harnesses. And, Tim, I know that board has kind of like this right angle connector where one board plugs into another. You remember that? Uh-huh. You definitely need to clean that because a lot of times that will get dirty. And, it, and there's so many different variations of Space Invaders that they're, you know, it's hard to keep up with all of them. But, um... But again, making sure all the connections are good is is going a long way. Touching up some cold solder joints. And Tim, it looks like some of the guys in the live chat also mentioned that. Uh, let's see. And um, yeah, Wasteland Warrior said bad connection, cold solder joint, broken trace, chip leg cracked. Exactly. Um, probably need to look for that kind of stuff, Joe. That kind of stuff is what's going to be causing a small issue like this. So kind of go over your entire board, touch up some cold solder joints, check all of your connections, make sure everything is good. And hopefully you can bring that sound back on that uh, on that effect. So let's see. Uh, let's see. <laughs> oh, YouTube Punk says, "What are Landon's arcade goals, Tim?" Uh, Landon's arcade goals are to get out of boot camp uh, and uh, get a good-paying job, so he can afford to uh, pay me to buy, build him, or buy him brand new games. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I think we're caught up on the live chat. So I'm going to go ahead and continue on here, Tim. So we we uh, we already addressed Jamie's question. If you're looking at the outline, so we're gonna we're gonna move to Croc Sox two nine two. Now, Tim, typically people send their names in, but uh, when they don't, I just use the first part of their email address. So we have Croc Sox two nine two here, and he has a question about a Street Fighter one, Tim. Okay. My 1987 Street Fighter has had multiple issues since I picked it up last month. There is no net glow on the monitor. Where should I look to fix slash replace something and with what? I'm planning on buying a separate monitor to replace it while I fix my OG monitor. Original gangster monitor, yes. Also, Street Fighter 1 and a plethora of other Capcom games used a rev joystick and mine only has one. Do you know where I could find a replacement red ball top? Thanks. 
So Tim, we got two questions here from Crocstox 292. So basically, we're having um, no Neglo on the monitor. It sounds, I mean, he doesn't mention specifically that he can hear the game playing. I'm kind of assuming that because I figure if he was saying that he doesn't hear the game playing, he would say, I don't hear the game playing or there's something else. So I'm assuming we're, we're kind of playing blind at this point. So that's the first one. And the second question is, where can he find a original red ball top joystick like the one that he has on his player two side of his Street Fighter one arcade game? Tim, what advice do you have for Croc Sox 292? Well, we'll take the first question, because, and that would be my first question to him. Is it, do you hear sound at all? Because if your power supply is out or something, of course, you're not going to get any glow on your monitor or um, gameplay at all. Or you could have the opposite. You could have glow on your monitor but no uh, gameplay. But he, the way, like you said, he surely it is not the issue. It sounds like it is a problem in his high voltage area of his monitor. And fortunately, we do have a really good video on that that he can watch. But just to go through it, there are some components in that high voltage section that he will probably need to replace and uh, take care of to, in order to fix this monitor or to send his chassis off for repairs. Absolutely. Now, um, Michael says, I thought SF1s had really weird hydraulic joystick. I don't know about the joystick, but they did have hydraulic game pads, Tim. The, um, the original Street Fighter had actually two different... Um, uh, two different little pads that you would punch, and depending on how hard you hit those, it would give you the the different uh, the different punches. So if you hit it lightly, it'd give you the light punch. Medium, it'd give you the medium, and heavy, it'd give you the heavy. Of course, Tim, they did away with that and went to the standard six button now um, six button layout uh, after a while, just because those pads were hard to replace. They got beat up all the time, and so even on Croc Soxes, you'll see that he's using the traditional six button layout. But Tim, what about that joystick? Um, where do you think he could find that um, that Capcom style ball top joystick? Well, I don't know of an exact replacement uh, these days, except for to keep checking on eBay and stuff. Maybe some guys in the chat room that are more into fighting games uh, would know. Or Jonathan, do you have an idea? I don't know of anywhere in particular selling that. I know what he's talking about. Right. Um, I'm not. But I don't necessarily think that was the original joystick either, though. I think that any. He could replace them both with some half four-way style. I think they would be just as happy. Oh, more than likely eight-way style, Tim. Yeah, but I mean, I think yeah. I think a half ball top would probably work just as well with these. But there is something about keeping the game original, Tim, and I do understand that. Now, um, I believe this is Prince of Pinball is here in the live chat. He says, I'm the person with the Street Fighter game, and it turns out it was the power supply, Tim. So apparently we weren't getting game either. So he says, turns out it was the power supply. Thanks for the help. So, right. So that's good. Good to know that. Yeah, a lot of times, Tim, um, like I said, if we hear just that the monitor doesn't get any net glow, we're thinking a monitor issue, but very possible it can be a power supply, which is why we always like to say here at Arcade Repair Tips, you always need to start a power, ASAP, right, Tim? Yeah, the ASAP approach will get you. Now, about his joystick, um, like, he said, like he said, does anybody in the chat room have an idea? Um, we didn't get a picture of the joystick because he has one of it's, them. I was about to say, that red one there, if you're looking at the outline, Tim, the red one there is the one I believe he's talking about. And I don't know okay. if there's anything special about that except for the fact they came on some Capcom cabinets, Tim. It may just be a standard ball top eight-way joystick. I mean, really. And I, we'd have to see it to see if it was any different than any other one. But like you said, Tim, he could just get some haps and put them in there and they'd probably be fine. So Unless he yeah, wants to, unless he just okay. really wants to have the originals, so... Yeah, so what he needs to Google search is the ultimate eight-way joystick, and I think that will probably work and and handle him better. And he actually chimed in, said he ended up replacing the joysticks with black bat tops, which Tim, when I think of Street Fighter, that's exactly the joystick I think of. Yeah, me too. More than the red ball that's on that one. So I'm sure he's happy with it any right now. Well, sure we're glad to hear that he's got everything going, Tim. It sounds like he's got his Street Fighter working. I have the answers to all the questions that we went over, but basically um, those don't apply considering it was more of a power supply issue. We were thinking it was probably going to be more of a um, more of a um, playing blind issue. But again, we do want to remind people, if you do have more of a playing blind issue where you hear the game playing but you don't have net glow, you don't have anything on the monitor, make sure you check out our post on troubleshooting games that are playing blind, right, Tim? Because that's the one that shows you uh, a lot of the troubleshooting procedures that we do. Yeah, it sounds like uh, he just got in there and got to got to work himself and figured it out. 90% of the stuff I figure out is just getting in there and getting to work I myself have to look up stuff on YouTube or other videos or uh, charts 
uh, schematics, all that stuff, but 90% of the fixes I do is just getting in there and, fix, and looking and tracking it down. Absolutely. Always starting at power, Tim, is always such a key. Um, you know, you want to make sure you're getting good, good power. Uh, you know, Tim, that... That saying, you know, um, is, is something that we kind of stole from uh, oh Williams programmer guy. I can't even think of his name at the moment, and I should because he's an owner of the game, yeah. game preserve too. But um, we kind of took it from him. But he also had another saying saying, you know, power's like mama. When mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Right. So I mean, that's another thing you always have to remember, guys, is that you always need to always start at power. It, it is always the the, um, the the first place you should start whenever you're doing any kind of repair because that will lead you that if you're getting good power that will if you eliminate that a lot of times you can find the other issues that you're having fairly easily so okay tim so i'm not like i said i think uh, as far as the the red ball tops go tim i didn't think we know anybody but he did what we would have recommended anyway just replacing them with some new ones and and like i said when i think of street fighter i think of bat Bad top joysticks, either black or red. Uh, mine has um, black bad top joysticks on it, Tim. My Street Fighter 2 does. So, I mean, I think if I'm playing, that's personally what I want to play with. So, um, But there you go. So we're going to go ahead and leave this. Now, he does say, I have one more issue with the credits and, and buttons not taking input to the PCB. It powers on, but the credit switcher coin buttons won't work. I've replaced all of them. So it might be a wiring issue, more than likely a wiring issue. Right, Tim? Yeah, especially if you've replaced them. And a uh, real quick check of that is just get you a jumper wire and uh, go across those where the wires come in. And if that works, um, then you know it's your switch. But if it doesn't work, then it could be in the wire somewhere there's a break or probably your ground wire. Now, Tim, when it comes to coin doors, we've seen this, I don't know how many times, where the wires will get pinched up in the door itself. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people will, a lot of operators and even cabinet uh, manufacturers will wrap those wires in order to keep that from happening. But if for some reason, at some point, you have to work on those wires, a lot of times they won't put that wrap back on. And so when the door closes, every time it closes, you're pinching those wires every single time. And, and another place where we have failure with that, Tim, is in the connector usually. A lot of times there's a connector that connects the, the wiring harness to the coin door. And if that connector is not making a good connection, then a lot of times you'll have the same problem. So, um, so Prince of Pinball, hopefully some of those tips will help you out. Um, and Tim, you can always use the continuity test, right? Make sure that you're getting connection all the way back to your harness as well, correct? That's correct. So there we go. So Prince of Pinball, hopefully that answers your new questions after you've solved your other questions. But we're so glad to hear that you've got the game up and running. And hopefully you're going to be enjoying your Street Fighter game for a long time to come. Okay, we had a couple other things here in the uh, live chat. Let me see if I can get it here. Um, let's see. Okay. The original run of cabinets used hydraulic buttons. Yeah, and the real hammer Billy Lee was saying, yeah, that's exactly correct. So I think the joysticks were this were were just regular eight-way joysticks on Street Fighter, but the original had the hydraulic buttons, which you would hit, and based on the intensity of your hit would be which one registered with the game, which is a cool concept, but in reality, I mean, operators, I'm sure, were having to replace those pads all the time, right, Tim? Oh gosh, that would have been an operator's nightmare. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's why we ended up they ended up going with the standard six button that we all are familiar with now. So Okay, Tim, I think we're caught up to the live chat. So let us continue on with our questions. The next one here is from Corey. Corey says, I have a question for you guys. I bought a big Buck Hunter Pro from an auction and it turns on, but it doesn't have the computer on the inside. What would it cost or take to fix this? Thanks. Corey, now he, he has a little quote at the end saying, get in the game, Tim. So there you go. Right. So I'll go ahead and say it. I don't know if that's how he wants me to say it, but he put like uh, four exclamation points on the end. So, you know, I don't know if I exclaimed enough, but we'll just say it. We'll leave it there. Now, Tim, you've we've had experience with this. We've talked about our Arctic Thunder escapade that, that happened one time where you bought one at auction for like $150, but it had no computer and no monitor chassis, which was fun. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, overall, yeah. though, when you're missing a computer, what can you really do about it in these type of games? Well, uh, you can talk to the manufacturer, being that it's sometimes they have, um, in this case, it would be raw thrills, right? Yes, correct. Uh, you know, you can talk to them and see if they have an old computer they would sell you. By now, they could probably care less about it. But they're actually pretty nice guys. What I would probably recommend is that you tell them, show them a picture that you have a game or whatever, that you're not just trying to remanufacture your own or something, and um, that it didn't have a computer with it. So maybe they could sell you one at a reduced cost, or more than likely, 
uh, you could buy a computer, send it to them, and have them load the gaming software on there. They're going to charge you for that also, but it would be cheaper than buying a computer probably from them. Yeah, and Tim, I believe these just use off-the-shelf Dell um, computers. I mean, I don't think there's anything special about them, but the things that are special about them are the software, the dongle typically has a dongle, yeah. security dongle that you'll have to have in order to play the game. And then there's an input-output board that you'll need as well in order to interface with the guns. <clears throat> those are And the buttons. Those are like the main points of this. So if you're missing all three of those, Tim, I mean, what are we looking cost-wise to get a new computer, a new I.O. board, and a new security dongle? A rough guess, probably 800 to $1,200. Golly. Um, and that would be conservative, I would think. Now, being that they're really nice guys and they may just have some stuff they would sell you used and everybody right now is kind of hurting for sales, um, they might would make you a deal. And I would just approach them on that way or if you sent them the computer, you might ask them, what kind of computer do I need to send you that you could fix up for this? In other words, um, they still sell, I'm sure, the owl boards, but you know, it's like, um, how fast does it need to be, how big a hard drive, or whatever do you need. Um, basically, you're going to have to talk to them or search eBay. Um, this is going to be a tough one to fix because, you know, just like Miss Pac-Man boards at one time, there were so many boards out, there were so many games. There wasn't a lot of extra boards. As games began to get destroyed, more boards were saved, stuff like that. It's probably not the case in these. You know, whatever was out there, an operator probably used it. So there's just not, it wasn't a huge home collector uh, trying to buy those up or replicate uh, those PCs. But they're very helpful, and I would definitely give them a call and go from there. There we go. So I'll go, I'll go ahead and, and throw this up here. Wait on Warrior says, uh, look for eBay for Big Buck Hunter parts. And Tim, that's also what we're going to recommend as an option. So as you probably guessed, you will need a new computer in order to get the game back up and running. You may also need a new I.O. board, depending on whether or not you have one inside your cabinet as well. These items are not cheap. Computers on eBay, Tim, go around 300 and the I.O. boards go for, more, for around 150 to 250 and other marketplaces. So they're definitely not, they're definitely not cheap, but if he can buy these, he may be back in business. Now, Tim, a lot of times you, you may still need the security dongle with that. So right. that's something to keep in mind, too. There may be an additional cost for, so, for a software package and a security dongle on top of that. So, um, you know, you just have to, you'll just have to see about that. But like Tim mentioned, try contacting Rothrill Support to see if they will sell to you directly. But they may want more than you can find it for otherwise. You can, And like, like we mentioned, you may be able to find it for cheaper on eBay. But remember that you need all those parts. You need the security dongle. You need the PC with the software loaded. And you need the I.O. board. If you're missing any part of that, it's not going to work. And so even if you buy those off eBay, you may need to ship, turn around and ship those to Rothrills in order to get everything working. Right, Tim? That's correct. So, any other advice here for Corey that we can give him? I mean, this is Tim. This is kind of a worst case scenario when buying a newer game is that the computer's not in there because you know basically at this point it's kind of like building it from scratch, right? Yeah, kind of. And like I said, the only advantage would just be that everybody's hurting for sales right now. Uh, there's not as many arcades open, so they're not selling a lot of parts. Maybe they would be generous or at least willing to do some of this kind of work now for us collectors. So, Whereas before they were concentrating on the retail end, they always got the priority, in other words. Absolutely. So, um, And like you mentioned, Tim, I mean, uh, we all know that Eugene Jarvis is still at Rothrills, correct? And there's a lot of um, people who have been in the arcade industry for years, I mean, at, at Rothrills now. And so it is, a, mm -hmm. uh, it is definitely um, one of the last arcade powerhouses, I would say, around, correct? Well, one of the last. There's still a few, but yeah, yeah, they definitely have a big, or, or were big, very big players uh, until the shutdown happened. You know. Absolutely. So uh, you can get in touch with them on their website, Tim. I mean, if you if you do a search Google Google search on uh, Rothrills, and they have a support number and an uh, email address that you can go to. So you may do that and just see what they would recommend for it. And uh, other than that, you know, eBay may be the way to go if you can find a cheap setup. But remember, I/O board, security dongle, and the software and the computer. Uh, you'll need all three. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Corey. And if you have any, if you need any additional help, please let us know, and we'll try to help you out further. Okay, Tim, we're to that point in the show where we do our questions from YouTube, our rapid-fire questions. And we have three this month that we're going to go over. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. So the first one is from Doreen, and she says, We have a cocktail table arcade game. We have sound but not video. Can you help us tr troubleshoot? Okay, that's the first one. 
Christopher says, uh, what if only half the monitor is working? I have a half a screen. So that's the second one. And then Dark as Andy says, I am looking for some info on horizontal size. I have the same monitor adjustments you do in your video, and there's no way for me to adjust the width of the screen. It, is it not possible? I can only make it bigger or smaller vertically. So Tim, we've got three here. We got Doreen who has sound but no video on her cocktail table. We have Christopher who is only getting half of the picture on his monitor. And we have Dark as Andy who is wondering if he can change the horizontal width on his monitor. So Tim, let's take them one at a time, starting with Doreen. Okay, sound but no video on a cocktail table. What do we need to do? Well, it sounds like she has the, the actual, what we've been talking about, or we talk about a lot, is the case of playing blind. She needs to really watch our video on that because there's many things that could be. Unfortunately, in that video, we come across just about every one of them. Absolutely. So that's the first one for Doreen. Christopher is having a half screen. What does he need to do, Tim? Well, he's experiencing some monitor foldover or something like that. He probably should start by doing a cap kit, and a lot of times that will solve that issue. Now, uh, Tim, I will chime in too. Maybe partial collapse? Maybe? Yeah. So um, we do have a video on repairing monitor collapse issues as well. So if you try a cap kit, you're still having problems, you may check out our video on repairing monitor collapse issues at that point. And then uh, Dark is Andy. How can he adjust the horizontal widths, Tim? Well, you need to find the coil itself, and uh, we talk about the TV alignment tool that we use. Uh, by all means, don't use a um, hex head Allen tool. wrench. Uh, Allen wrench. Um, you get the right tool and try that. He may end up having to replace his uh, horizontal whip coil. Sounds good. Well, let me just go ahead and put all those up here, real t uh, Tim, real quick, so that way we can kind of go over them. So, Doreen. Sounds like a pretty standard case of playing blind. Please see our post on troubleshooting games that are playing blind for more information on that. Christopher, your monitor is either experiencing partial collapse or maybe fold over. Try cap kit first, like Tim mentioned. And then if that doesn't help, check out our post on repairing monitor collapse issues. That should help you out. And then Dark is Andy. Tim, Tim mentioned the horizontal width coil. This is what you need to look at, okay? And you, we have a whole post on it on our website, adjusting the horizontal width coil. And make sure you use the TV alignment tool for this, right, Tim? Because otherwise, uh, you might burn your fingers. You may break a coil. There's a lot of things that can go wrong if you're not using the right tool, right? That's correct. There you go. So, Tim, I think we hit those uh, fairly rapidly and quickly. So, hopefully, all of those questions... Uh, are answered but if you have any additional questions about your question doreen christopher or dark is andy please let us know and we'll try to help you out further so uh tim we do have let's see danny says is final lap 2 medium res do you know if it's a medium res game tim that is a um, namco driving game final lap 2 that would not surprise me if it is because it seems like a lot of those japanese driving games are medium res but, yeah. you know, KLOV usually will list whether or not it's a standard res or a medium res. And so you may check KLOV and see uh, what it says it is. And that, uh, like I said, now KLOV is not always right. I, I will say that. But it is, right. it is right more often that it's incorrect. So um, if it does say if it's medium res, more than likely it is probably a medium res. There's a chance it could still be standard. But um, most of the times, like I said... 85% of the time, KLOV is, is correct on that stuff. So check out KLOV, Danny, and see see if you can find out what the resolution is for it. Okay, Tim. That's, oh, Michael Bloom says Eugene Jarvis is a god. You know, you, Eugene Jarvis is awesome, Tim. I mean, we've already, we covered Robotron earlier, um, but just think of all of the, the wonderful games he's been involved in, right? Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt, John. Uh, yes, we like Eugene Jarvis. I'm looking on Arcade dash museum.com yeah what K L O V basically yeah it, it and they say that well it's kind of like a i remember it being being standard okay okay and it they listed a standard but um anyway what i'm thinking is is that there could be a uh why is he asking in other words is it medium <laughs> resolution is what he's asking yeah, I'm asking why is he asking? Is he having problems? Is it coming up like triple screen? That yeah, I I, I don't know. He he's just asking if it's medium res. That's it. Yeah, I think it's standard. Okay. And I remember it being standard because we had one. Yeah, I think I, I think I think that's correct. Like I said, it's just that it seems like a lot. Go ahead. We swapped out some monitors on it, and I think we tried a medium res from a cruising, and it didn't work. Gotcha. 
So, yeah, I mean, like I said, it just seems like a lot of those Japanese driving games are, but not every one. Not every one. So, so it could... Yeah, it, if, if KLOV says it's standard, I, I'm going to lean towards KLOV, so... Yeah, it is on KLOV, does say that. Okay, sounds good. So there you go. It is a standard resolution, Danny, uh, according to KLOV, so hopefully that helps. Uh, now, Tim, it's time for your tech tip, and I, I kind of helped you out with this one because I saw this, and I, I kind of sent it to you and, and thought you may think it was cool, but I'll let you I'll let you read over it for everybody so they can get an idea of what we're talking about here. Okay, you're going to go ahead and bring the screen yeah, up? Yeah, I got it up. Uh, my, my tech tip is about the Slaptastic um, chip that's now available, and um, they, they come up, it's come up available a few times throughout the years, but it's kind of raised its head again, I guess you could say, and a lot of people aren't even aware of what it is. So just in the description, I'll read it here. Most of Atari's best arcade games of the mid to late 80s used a custom slaptastic chip to discourage hardware bootleggers. Um, most of you remember if you've had a Pac-Man or Miss Pac-Man, a lot of times you'll see a boot or Galaga. There was a lot of bootlegging, bootleg boards coming and going at that time. Um, so they put this on there to discourage that. Um, 35 years later, many valuable game boards have ended up hopelessly broken when their slaptastic chips went missing or died of old age, kind of like um, the Street Fighter boards and stuff would die, you know, in, until we figured out or somebody figured out how to um, bring them back from the dead, they were just dead. There were tons of them just laying everywhere. So uh, the Slaptastic chips were missing or died of old age, and then the Slaptastic helps bring these games back to life. Price is $50 plus shipping, around $4 or so, and there's a link that you can purchase those at. But um, I think if, if you've been around a while, you're familiar with this chip. And uh, basically, it just is a security chip, or uh, kind of what we talked about earlier, is an early version of a dongle. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's a good way to say it. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of games. And Tim, when I think, I guess Marble Madness is one of the ones that comes to mind whenever I think about the slapstick chips. But um, there's a lot of Atari games that use these chips. And instead of having, and, I mean, and for a while, you couldn't get any replacements. If they just died, they died kind of like... Uh, like you're talking about with the CPS2 suicide stuff. But now you can get the Slaptastic, you can put that chip in, the, in there, and all you have to do is set the um, dip switches to the correct game, which is pretty cool. On the on the link there, it actually has the um, the dip switches for each game, so you can go there and see like what the dips are for your particular Atari game that you're trying to revive. But uh, Tim, the chip has been around for a while, but Hot Rod Arcade just started carrying it, and they have a supply of them. Um, before, I think you had to do like a special order out of the UK or something like that, and it yeah. took a while to get them. So it's nice to have have something that's readily available, easy to purchase, and can bring your your dead Atari boards back back to life. Uh, any other thoughts about the slap slaptastic? No, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, maybe if anybody has, we've never actually used one, um, even when they were kind of available before. I'm kind of curious if anybody in the chat room has actually purchased one or used it yet. Yeah, I, I am too. I mean, I. You know, I don't really have any Atari games of that era anymore like I used to. And so, I mean, I have had no reason to purchase it. But, I, you know, for those people who do have those, the Slaptastic seems like a fantastic uh, uh, part to have around just in case. So, for sure. But uh, now that you can get them readily available from uh, Hot Rod Arcade, I think it, it's really it's really nice. $50 plus $4 shipping is pretty cheap for what you're getting, considering that it's basically going to revive your board if you're having that issue. So, um, good stuff, guys. Make sure you check it out. Uh, if you've got um, any of those... Um, Atari uh, slap uh, slapstick uh, chip based uh, boards and uh, should hopefully revive them for you if you're having issues with them. So, okay, I've got Danny here. He says he's having problems with one side of the monitor; it's jumping a little bit, and the other side is perfect. I'm used to um, I am I am used LCD monitors, and the graphics are different looking on the second monitor. Okay, I'm having problems with one side of a monitor; it's jumping a little bit. The other side is perfect, and I'm using LCD monitors and the graphics are different looking uh, on the second monitor. So I, it sounds like he may have two monitors and the graphics are different on one other than uh, over the other. I'm thinking it's a different monitor or something. Um, what do you think, Tim? Just based on that, it's it's kind of it's kind of hard. Let's see. It sounds like oh, he's using LCD monitors and the graphics uh -huh. are different looking on the second monitor. So. He's got two LCD monitors, and he's saying the graphics are different on one monitor than they are on the other. Okay, so, so you got one monitor that works fine? Right, correct. 
Okay, and then one that's kind of jumping on that side. Right. So yeah. probably the first thing we would do is swap them, right? Yeah. And see if the see if the problem happens. See where the problem ends up. If the problem happens on the second monitor uh, after you swap them, so like let's say the problem was on the second monitor, you swap it, and now the problem moves to the first monitor. Then there's got to be a connection problem somewhere in that, or something on that board that's having the issue. Um, and, and this would be like if you're doing a driving game, right? Like where you have two different monitors, you've got uh, two different game boards, maybe, and they're linked or something to that effect. If you had that and you had one that was kind of screwy looking and one that wasn't, a lot of times that's what we do, Tim. We put them back to back. We'd swap them, see if the problem carries over just so we could eliminate whether or not it's a monitor problem or a board problem, correct? Right. And so, Danny, that's... Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. I'm listening. I was going to say, and so that's what we'd recommend doing first, right, Tim, is to try the swap and see what happens. Right. So if the problem carries over to the to the to the new monitor um, dur after the swap, then it is probably something with the connection to that monitor. If the problem does not carry over and it stays on the original monitor, then it's probably a problem with the monitor. Correct. Correct. So I mean that, and we've done this a lot, Tim, with driving games. This is like our go-to when you have like a sit-down two-player driving game or back-to-back cabinets or something to that effect where we'll just swap them real quick just so we can figure out is the problem in the monitor is the problem in the connection is the problem in the game board uh but if the problem travels more than likely it's got to be something other than the monitor that's causing the issue so uh danny try that and see if it works and since they're lcd you may even try just taking an off-the-shelf lcd and hooking it up just to see if if um the problem if you can't do the full-on swap that would be basically the equivalent of that as well right tim yeah, also be careful where your speaker is in this game, um, that you don't get it too close to um, any kind of monitor. And I have seen it cause some issues, unshielded and stuff. Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, it, it could be it could be a variety of things, but uh, try the swap and see, because that'll at least help you eliminate some things um, going forward, whether or not it's a monitor or a board issue. Okay, Tim, let us see here... Oh, okay. So let us get into the discussion portion. Now, Tim, I didn't do any kind of arcade debate or arcade quote-unquote discussion like we normally do just because it's January and I didn't really feel like fighting. And after all the fighting that's already happened, I kind of felt like we should bring some peace to things. So uh, no debate for this month, guys. I'm sorry. But um, we did mention earlier in the show that uh, I'm wearing my uh, Game Preserve gear. I've got my got my cup here, which has a different beverage in it now, Tim, and um, I've got my uh, shirt on, but uh, the Game Preserve has been trying to raise money, Tim, in order to stay open, and they're very, very close to their goal. They're like 90% of the way there, so um, they had a nice write-up here, Tim, in uh, the Houston Chronicle that we posted up on our Facebook page. It was called Continue, Save, Quit. Houston Arcades Face Unprecedented Struggle During the Pandemic, and you guys can check it out at the link below. But uh, they had a nice picture of Rusty, Tim. I don't know if you actually saw the, um, if you saw the article, okay. but Rusty they had a good picture of him, and it says, in June, William Russell Key, Key's arcade business, the game preserve, was already in jeopardy. Rent's about $10,000 a month, and I have two locations, so that's $20,000 a month I'm losing, said Key. It adds up fast, plus electricity and insurance, a lot of stuff that doesn't stop, even though the doors were closed. He said, right now, with all of the government loans and stuff that we've got, we're a quarter million in debt. Wow. And so, Tim, I'm just going to encourage you that if you want to help out uh, Rusty and Eric and Joe and all of the great people who are involved with the Game Preserve, Tim, they're so close to reaching their goal, like I mentioned, go get some swag from their shop. That's at GamePreserveHouston.com slash shop. And, uh, and Tim, I obviously did that. I bought you one of these, too. Did I forget to mention? I, didn't, I haven't gotten it to you yet, but uh, you're going to have it here in a little bit. So, um, but I bought a, sh a shirt, two mugs for me and Tim. And of course we bought stuff earlier, um, when they were selling some stuff as well, Tim, but we've been trying to help out our friends as much as possible. And Tim, if you, maybe you don't, I mean, it's okay if you don't want to help out the game preserve, maybe throw some bucks to your local arcade. Cause man, I look at Facebook all the time and all I see are these heartbreaking posts of people who are having to close down arcades because of the pandemic. And Tim, it, it literally is heartbreaking to me. These are people who the only dream that they had was to run an arcade and to bring some entertainment and fun to families. And they're having to close down because of these unprecedented times. It's really depressing. So if you're not going to throw some money to the Game Preserve in Houston, throw some money to your local arcade and help them out because I'm telling you they need it. Buy some merch from them. Order some takeout if they offer takeout food or drinks or whatever. Um, do what you can because if, if we don't all help them out, they're not going to be around after the pandemic's over. So, 
Tim, you got anything to add? Well, just, you know, it's not just that. The rest of them are still open. Another problem they're having is people who are still laid off and can't work, and so that their normal folks are all hurting, too. So not just them particularly, but um, just, you know, it, Anybody that's struggling right now, we just want our, want them to know our prayers are with them. And uh, if you can, maybe you can support a. If you can't support a local arcade, you might can support a local friend. If nothing else, by just calling on them, encouraging them. Uh, you know, and, and 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 we may talk about this some more in the after show. One thing this country needs is just to be nice to each other. You know, and and uh, we'll we'll get back in this and we'll survive. But, you know, not every arcade will survive. Not every person will survive. So we got to continue to work through this together. And we do wish them the best and all the arcades out there. So by all means, if you are able to work and you can help or can give, please do. It really uh, would mean a lot to them and, and a lot to us personally with our ties. And uh, it would be just about like giving to us, Jonathan. It would be that close to us and our fan base and people that enjoy us and stuff. So, um, you know, one, another good point to bring up, we always um, are here. We, we like to talk about games. It's a good distraction. Uh, and these places are good for people to get to go and play and uh, to forget about their problems and things and join their friends. No matter what political affiliation, we all drop those tags when we go in the doors and we play a game together. So, um, if anything, we need more arcades, right, <laughs> instead of less. So, try to support them if it's at all possible. Absolutely. And, Tim, I mean, your message goes to heart. I mean, guys, it, it, it's a tough time out there. So, if it's, not, if it's not helping an arcade, it's helping an individual who may need some extra rent money or it's, it's, helping, um, it's helping your neighbor, whoever that may be. Because, Tim, I mean, right now, all of us are facing tough times. And, guys, I mean... Can't count on the government to do it for you, cause man, they they sure <laughs> they sure can't get the money out. I guess uh, based on the last stimulus, a lot of people were hoping for a lot more and they didn't get it. And there's a lot of people, Tim, who need a lot more. And so yeah. the need is great. And so if you have the resources to help out an arcade or to help out a fellow a friend or something like that, now's the time to do it, guys. Because there, like Tim mentioned, there's a lot of people out there hurting, not just in arcades but all over. So um, you know, try to help out wh where you can. If that's by sending some money to arcades, if that's by giving some money to your neighbor, whatever that is, um, you know, guys, it's tough out there. It's tough right now. And um, you know, for those of us who are you know, who, who have some means, you know, let's try to do what we can to pull together and help people out for sure. And, and yep. like I said, I mean, the reason why we, we talk about the game preserve Tim is because Eric and Rusty are part of our team here. They really are. Um, you know, they, they did a lot of, uh, podcast episodes with us and Tim, we hate to see when our friends are struggling and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, sure they have an arcade, but man, they're really struggling right now. They really are. And so we want to try to help them as best we can. All right. Uh, and for most of us listening to this show right now, arcades are essential. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm in that group. That's an essential business right there, Tim, for sure. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. let's. Uh, YouTube Punk says if his if he were Bezos rich, I'd be bailing out all of these arcades. You see, well, I would I would too. In fact, um, I don't know if you heard though. It's Elon Mount Musk passed Bezos today. Uh, for yeah, the richest dude. man in the world. So if I was were Elon Musk rich, I'd be bailing out everybody for sure. But, um, you know, Tim, it, it's just tough. I mean, it, it's tough. I mean, even with all the money in the world, you couldn't help everybody necessarily. I mean, it'd be it'd be a tough thing to do. So, I mean, you know, those of us those, those of us who have, you know, let's try to help out where we can. I mean, it doesn't have to be much, guys. You know, buy, I mean, I think the mug was five or ten bucks, Tim, or whatever it was, you know. But, um, but you know, it, it if it helps them out, then it helps them out. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's kind of like a homeless person, and they were begging for money. And I pulled over, and all I had was a dollar, and I gave them a dollar. And the person with me, I think a dollar's going to help them much. And I looked behind me, and there was a string of about 20 cars. I said it would if every car gave a dollar. And that changed their viewpoint on giving. It's not about the amount sometimes. It's uh, just about what your heart and what you do. So five dollars might not mean much to you, you, but corporately, when everybody sends in that money, it could really help them out. Absolutely. So, Danny says, "Yeah, sad that all businesses are struggling, struggling uh, though, but arcades definitely because that is, 
uh, getting hard to find them any uh, anymore, or even more though. Yeah, I mean, it, arcade. It's tough because arcades are kind of uniquely positioned to be more of a social gathering place. And right now, when you're not having social gatherings, it makes it really hard to have have a place that's a social gathering place. And so, um, like I said, you know, if you can't help them out, guys, we're not. I mean, we're not going to harp on this too much. But if you've got the means and you can't help them out, help them out. Right, Tim? Yeah. So there we go. So, um, but uh, we're wishing Eric and Rusty the best. Tim, I mean, they're so close. Like I said, 10%. They just have to get 10% of their go- uh, 10% of the way to their goal, and then they're there. So, again, just a little bit more, and we'll be there, guys. Uh, help them out if you can. And, you know, if you're not, not them, just help out somebody or another arcade or whatever you can. Uh, every little bit, I think, uh, goes a long way right now with uh, people struggling. So, Okay, what do I have next here on the old outline, Tim? Oh, how about Led Zeppelin pinball, Tim? Yeah. What do you think about this? I, I think we have, uh, you know, not that something I wanted to rush out, but we had some people that were very close to us that were very interested in this pinball game. So yeah, and he's not I here. To, was- he's not here tonight. I was hoping he'd be here, but we'll talk about that here in a second, Tim. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and talk a little bit about it. All the models of the new Led Zeppelin announced by Stern Pinball uh, feature three steel ramps, three banks of drop targets a three bank drop target uh and three flippers throughout the play field a toy of the swan song records icarus will also be included that will apparently leap about the machine whenever the ball is hit now the higher end models the premium and the limited edition um will also feature an electric magic toy that will capture balls make them disappear and both lock and launch them around the machine and lo- along with some other things tim i just kind of i just kind of uh, threw some of the uh, different um, toys and things that were on it. But Tim, I liked the, the designs. I thought that it was very well designed. It matches the Led Zeppelin, uh, their diff- some of their different albums and things and their artwork, which I thought yeah. was really cool. But uh, like you mentioned, Tim, our own Louie actually put down his uh, his down payment on one and is going to get a premium model very soon. And I did talk him into doing a um, an unboxing, but he said I had to edit it, which means that it'll be done in like 37 years. So um, okay. you, you won't see it for a while because as everybody knows, I'm terrible with with editing it takes me forever but um he he did order one tim which i thought was awesome louis a big led zeppelin fan so i, I mean tim i want to play it i definitely want to give it a play um i i'm not one that would probably put down money on this particular theme but if you are man it, it looks like a a uh, very promising machine for those led zeppelin fans out there like big fans yeah I think so. And it is really cool. I can't wait to play one myself. Yeah, I'm going to have to make a trip to Louie's house and, and try, it, <laughs> try it out at some point. Uh, he lives pretty far away from here. I'm not going to say where he lives, but he lives pretty far away from here. But I've made a tri- I've seen him before. We've, we, you know, we've uh, talked and everything. But I uh, might have to make a trip to, to Louie's just to play it. So looking forward to that. Um, now, Wasteland Warrior said he thought the play field looked empty and boring. Hopefully it plays better than the gameplay I've seen. You know, I mean, these games nowadays, it, it's really, you know, it's really tough. But I mean, Theme plays a lot into it for people, and I think that's how it was with Louis. Is that he's just such a big Led Zeppelin fan. For him, this was this was a go-to theme that he wanted. And if you're like that, Tim, a lot of times, if I mean, if it's a theme that I really, 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 really love, I mean, the gameplay can just be all right, and I'll probably still enjoy it, right? Yeah. Especially with a music pin where you're hearing the music from from the band, right? I mean, and you already like the music, so you already know that you like that. So I mean, uh, with that, I think I I think like I said, for a lot of people, that the theme makes the pinball machine. And Tim, the Sturm pinball machines lately have played fine. I mean, uh, some of them are are very good, but most of them I enjoy. I I, I don't th- I can't think of one, a recent game that I played that I I dislike. Most of them right. play pretty decently, and so while it may look a little empty. Um, like I said, I mean, as long as you're a fan of the band, it's going to play decently. Stern's going to make sure it does. So, I mean, I think it will be a huge seller for them. What about you, Tim? I think so. I think it was a good choice. Absolutely. This is something I think a lot of people have been wanting for a long time. And, you know, Tim, I think we can all agree that ACDC basically opened back up the door for music pins. Because there for a while, man, there were some really bad music pins. I think about Rolling Stones with the Mick on the Stick. Yeah. And some of the other ones. I mean, there were some that were just terrible, but... But when ACDC came back, it kind of opened the door for pretty much every other band uh, to to uh, to have their pinball machine based on that formatting of doing the mode select with the songs and all that kind of stuff. So, but I want to play it. So at some point, hopefully, Tim will both get be able to. But I will tell you this. We're not going to be playing it at the 2021 Texas Pinball Festival, unfortunately, because they canceled it. So I'll go ahead and put the scene up here. Despite, and this is from the Texas Pinball Festival Committee... 
Despite our hopes of moving forward with 2021, it is apparent that the United States and other countries are not ready for large events or travel. To say we are disappointed is an understatement, but the support and understanding of everyone in the pinball community has reassured us that this is the best decision for the safety of everyone and the preservation of Texas Pinball Festival. Paid 2020 guests and vendors will be carried over to 2022. Stay tuned for more information and updates in the coming months. And Tim, this is so sad because we missed last year. Really hate that we're going to be missing this year too, you know? It's just, it's, it's, um, but I think they made the right call here. As much as I don't like it, obviously, it's still the right call, right? I think so. I mean, it's too yeah. early. We haven't had enough people get the vaccine yet. And, you know, you, you, you can't risk it. You can't risk it. So, what were you going to say? I, I said you're, you're right. It's, um, I don't think they had a choice. You know, it wasn't really an option this year. Exactly. So, um, considering they're so early, if they had been, in, you know, later in the year, maybe October, November time frame, kind of like when we get the Houston Expo, um, they may have had a better shot at it. But being, being in March, I think, made it difficult. They kind of had to pull the trigger quick on it. So, um, totally understand. Hopefully, you know, they, they can uh, carry everything over to, to uh, 2022. And I look forward to playing some pinball then, Tim. And hopefully we'll get to go to at least one festival this year. I don't, maybe the... The Houston Expo will be on. I guess we'll just have to see how things are going with the um, with the vaccine and everything. Tim, uh, talking about that real quick, you, have you known anybody who's gotten the vaccine yet, and how were they? Um, no, I don't know anybody because I don't have many friends in the healthcare field. That's pretty much the only people around here that's been able to get it. Um, so uh, what about you, John? Uh, I've got about five people that I know that have had it. Three are nurses, three are elderly, or two are elderly, excuse me. Um, uh -huh. And nobody's grown a third arm yet, so I think we're in good shape. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, they are giving it to people who are 65, 70 plus right now in Texas. Um, you can a lot of times get through your doctor. So if you go to your doctor, if you're in that 65, 70 uh, age range or older, if you talk to them about it, you can get it. So um, the other three, like I said, were healthcare workers who got it, and they they've been fine um, after the vaccine. So I'm hoping that you know. By mid to late spring, we're going to be able to get it ourselves. So we're just going to have to see how it goes from there, though. So, um, Danny says, love to play the Led Zeppelin plus the new Guns N' Roses uh, to love rock um, love rock music, though. Yeah, I want to play the new Guns N' Roses for sure from, from Jersey Jack. I've been wanting to give it a, a whirl since they debuted it. And Tim, we love the original De Data East uh, Guns N' Roses machine. It's a cool one, so uh, I'm hoping that the JJP version of that is uh, is just as good, if not better. So. I hope so. There we go. So, um, let's see what else we have here. Floyd's Arcade has one on order. Can't wait to try it out. Just glad companies are still making games. Yeah, and you know, Tim, I think it's actually for like um pinball machine companies and for the smaller home arcade companies i think the pandemic has actually helped them quite a bit because people are buying pinball machines in lieu of going on vacations and things it seems like yeah so um but now like you said i think with the bigger raw thrills pieces that really aren't made to put in people's houses i think that's where they've probably been hurting you know it's just that they don't really have the same kind of machine that people want in their house and that re that's really what it comes down to well, they don't, uh, but ISIS definitely uh, selling home ski ball units and stuff, so they're having to change up their business plan a little bit this next year. Yeah, and uh, Tim, it's smart on their part. I mean, ISIS is a big player in the industry, and hopefully some of their home arcade units, they are expensive, Tim. The ICE home arcade units are not cheap, but, you know, it's, it's cheaper than a pinball machine in a lot of cases, and people are buying those, so I think I think ICE is, is doing good by making that transition to the home market, so... Okay, uh, let's see. Delusionals Arcade is here. He says, Happy New Year, everyone. And YouTube Punk says, Happy New Year to you, too. Happy year, New Year to everybody. Hope you Again, we hope that everybody has a great 2021. We're looking forward to it, for sure. So, Now, Tim, I think this is the last thing on my outlines here, Tim. And this is... I actually ended up watching it um, before the show. I didn't know if I was going to get to, but I did. I have seen it now. But that is the Insert Coin documentary that tells the behind-the-scenes story of Midway Games during the arcade boom of the 90s. And you can get on Amazon. We have our Amazon ad link there for you guys to check it out. And I'll be posting that in the show notes um, probably tomorrow sometime. But, Tim, have you watched it yet? No, I didn't, didn't even know it was out there yet. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know it was on Amazon. It's on Amazon. you got to buy it. It's like $10 or something like that. I can't remember. But okay. it is fantastic. Basically, it tells the story of kind of 
uh, kind of the comeback of Williams Midway Valley and, and you know, um, starting starting with uh, NARC and then working its way through Mortal Kombat and Terminator 2 and even Revolution X, Tim. Um, really cool stuff. And um, NBA Jam is kind of included in that as well. Uh, great documentary. I enjoyed it immensely. And if you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's great. So, uh, but I'll read the synopsis here. Insert Coin is the amazing behind-the-scenes story of one of the greatest video game studios of all time, Midway Games. Led by the godfather of video games, Eugene Jarvis, the company pioneered the concept of live-action gaming, kickstarting a new arcade boom and grossing billions of dollars in the process with massive hits like Mortal Kombat and NBA Jam. Franchises that are still popular today. Now available to rent or buy on Amazon and Virtual Cinemas. Please see their website at insertcoindoc.com uh, for more information. Um, yeah, and you can, like I said, we have our Amazon ad link up there too, guys, if you guys want to um, check it out there. But you can buy it, you can rent it, watch it. It's great. Um, and, you know, it really, do, they do interviews with a lot of the main people, Tim, that were at um, Williams and Valley and Midway during that time. And um, it, it, I tell you, they tell some great stories. So if you're into those 90s arcade games uh, by Midway, Tim, you're going to love it. Great stuff. So, uh, Delusional's Arcade says, good story, subpar filming, lots of shots were blurry. I agree, yeah, the filming was a little rough, but the story, I mean, it's just, the reason you watch the documentary is for the story, right, Tim? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, the filming's okay, I mean, that's fine, but uh, it's all about the story, and this, it is a great story. If you're a fan of Mortal Kombat or NBA Jam, you should definitely check it out. Those seem to be the two really featured ones of, of the ones they talk about, but they also have Re Revolution X talk in there, Terminator 2 talk. NARC gets a lot of love, because NARC was kind of like the first game that they used the, um, the filming of the live-action actors to put in the game and things like that, so um, great stuff, very entertaining, highly recommended. Insert Coin documentary on Amazon right now. Okay, Tim, I think we're we're about ready to wrap it up here. So I'm going to go ahead and remind everybody that we are looking for arcade-related videos. If you want some free advertising for your YouTube channel, we're looking for people to submit short videos about arcade-related topics. Send a link of your video to questions at arcaderepairtips.com, and our staff will review it. Uh, if we like it, we'll use it during one of our live show episodes. Make sure you put the plug in for your channel so people will know where to find you. We look forward to seeing your submissions as always, Tim. And we haven't got any of those in a while, but again, we want to help out the smaller arcade channels. If you're um, not monetized now and you're trying to build your audience and you're, you have arcade-related content, please send over uh, kind of a sample of what your content is, and we'll try to put it on the live show and give you a little bit of uh, promotion there because we want to help you guys out and want to get you guys monetized for sure. And then, Tim, of course, we have all of our contact information. I'll just go ahead and wrap it up here. We have our general email address at questions at arcaderepairtips.com, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. If you put live show in the subject, it will get mentioned on the show. That's usually how we do it. So, again, that's questions at arcaderepairtips.com, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. Then we have our YouTube page at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. Of course, if you're watching this live, you are already here, but you may be watching this on our webpage or after the pack fact or you may be listening to it on the podcast and if that's the case make sure you check out the video version of this at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com and uh, comments from the last live show will be covered on the next episode and then we have our podcast email that goes to eric and rusty of course tim we talked about them earlier is there uh part of the ownership team of the game preserve but you can also reach them by emailing podcast at arcade repair tips.com hopefully we're going to get an episode out of them at some point but tim with all of the things that they're going through right now i understand that trying to record one may be difficult so we it may be a while before we get another episode but uh, if you want to listen to the episodes that are already out there make sure you check out our itunes page at itunes.arcade repair tips.com or stitcher page at stitcher.arcade repair tips.com we also are on spotify if you search for arcade repair tips and the um, question answer podcast you'll find on spotify as well and if you're on stitcher or itunes make sure you leave us a good review we'd love that uh, let us know how we're doing we always appreciate that but again itunes.arcaderepairtips.com and stitcher.arcaderepairtips.com uh, in order to listen to the podcast and then tim we have our social media pages facebook.arcaderepairtips.com and tim always we always want to thank mark and louis for the absolutely fantastic job they do posting uh, all of the great stories for on our Facebook pages and all of that stuff does get cross-posted to our Twitter feed as well at twitter.arcaderepairtips.com. So if you're not on Facebook and you'd rather just follow us on Twitter, you get to pretty much the same content in both places. But again, facebook.arcaderepairtips.com for Facebook and twitter.arcaderepairtips.com for our Twitter feeds. And we do answer questions on both from time to time. So if you want to leave your questions there, you can as well. Uh, Tim, it looks like we, had, we may have had an, a late question come in the live chat real quick. 
Um, Mike says, can anyone help me get my Rave Racers to work? He said, um, let's see. Um, Hi, my Namco Rave Racer does not work after I restored the body work. But he's not talking about, he's not saying exactly what happened. If it's if it happened after you've done some, like, uh, cabinet restoration, it may be that something came unplugged during that. Tim, a lot of times when we're doing, lamin when we're laminating an arcade cabinet, we like to lay it on its side. And so uh -huh. sometimes during that process, things will come disconnected, correct? It's very likely or very easy. Even a wire or something can come undone. Absolutely. So um, if it happened after your cabinet restoration, more than likely it's because something got shaken. Uh, Tim, something you always need to make sure of anytime you transport or you're going to lay a game on its side is to make sure that everything's screwed down and, connect and, and that there's nothing like just kind of flopping around your arcade cabinet like uh, we've seen chassis that weren't screwed down main board main game boards that weren't screwed down and as soon as you lay that thing on its side everything jolts over so make sure anytime you're you're going to be laying down a game or you're going to be transporting a game that everything is secured before you do it that way you don't end up with more problems uh, than what you started with so um that happens a lot we see that quite a bit so uh, Danny Ransom says, could you add a bigger monitor to an Arcade 1-Up? Yes, you can. Uh, you can get the, uh, there's an adapter that you can get that will allow you to do VGA output from the, uh, or allow the monitor to accept a VGA output. I think there's a backwards adapter too that will allow you to take the inputs from the, um, from the Arcade 1-Up board and use them on a VGA monitor. I have not seen that as much as I've seen the other, but there is a video out there about it that um, I've seen posted on some of the Arcade 1-Up groups. So if you're interested in that, you may want to do a search on YouTube for using a, um, a monitor with an original Arcade 1-Up PCB, I believe is what that video is called. But there is one about that. I don't think it was very difficult, so if you want to make the, the monitor bigger, if you want to go with a bigger monitor in it, then you'll probably need to look at that video and get an adapter as well. So, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, David says in the, um, in the documentary, Insert Coin, they also cover Revolution X. Um, and they do. And it's pretty, it's pretty interesting how all that happened. I don't want to give away the, um, uh, anything from the documentary, Tim, but the part about Revolution X is very interesting. Because you're probably wondering to yourself, why did they make a gun game about Aerosmith, right? If you want to know, watch the documentary. You'll find out. Oh, okay. So there you go. But um, anyway, guys, um, it sounds like I think we're about done. Delusional says, don't forget to give a thumbs up, folks. Pay it forward in 2021. We do appreciate all your thumbs up, of course. And uh, make sure you go follow Delusional's Arcade on YouTube, too, guys. He's got great content, great channel there. Um, and uh, like I said, we there's so many great arcade repair-related channels here on YouTube. Delusional's Arcade is one of them. Maddie Moe's Arcade is one of them. You guys check those out if you haven't already. Um, Tim, I think we're about done here. So is there anything else you want to say before we uh, sign off here and move on to the after show? Any after show teasers may be good. So, Well, uh, we probably won't talk politics much, but we will talk about, we may, may address a few things like that, but we will talk about um, some shows that we've watched, and I may talk about the stock market a little bit. I've got a few tips for the coming year as uh with different administration different things to invest in will come up yeah and i actually um you know speaking of things we watched tim I've, i got to watch a lot over the holidays the one thing i think we both said we watched was wonder woman 1984 so if you're interested in hearing our thoughts on that um tim obviously 84 is a very near and dear uh, time to both of our hearts we both like 1984 a lot of great arcade games happened then but if you want to hear our thoughts on wonder woman 1984 make sure you stay tuned to the after show or if you're listening to this on the podcast feed make sure you check out the youtube video for the after show so well tim i think that's going to wrap it up here um okay hang on we got something coming in milo says um it's making noise but no screen uh, i striped it um i striped i stripped it into little pieces put it all back power goes into the pcb board under the tube but no glow so man that could be a number of things right tim that could be a connection issue first of course, we're always going to say start at power. So we'd probably right. recommend, you know, just making sure that all of your power connections are good. It's the ones to the board, including the ones to the monitor. Make sure that you're getting voltage there. Test it with your multimeter there, Milo, to make sure that you're getting vol good voltages all the way around. That's going to be very important. So anytime you do that, you definitely want to recheck your voltages to make sure everything's dialed in. Okay, Tim. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. We may um, end up addressing a little bit more of Milo's question in the after show. But um, anyway, guys, we hope that you have a wonderful 2021. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the live show. And we hope to see you back here next month. And remember here at Arcade Repair Tips when we fix the game, Tim. You play the game. Take care, everybody. We'll see you in the after show or we'll see you for the next live show in February. We'll see you then. Good night.
you for watching this episode of the Arcade Repair Tips live show. All of our past episodes are available on our website at ArcadeRepairTips.com or on our YouTube page. This show is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. Please consult a professional before attempting to repair any coin-operated machines yourself. The preceding program is a Varcade Entertainment production.
And we're back. Tim's here. Uh, finally got back. I told everybody I was waiting on you, so. Okay. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I tell you what, Tim, it's been a crazy, uh, crazy couple of days here, I think, in the United States, for those of you guys who haven't been keeping up. I'm sure even people overseas, though, have probably heard the news about the U.S. Capitol and what happened. So, um, Tim, I'm glad that we could just kind of chill out tonight and, and kind of focus on other things and hang out and, uh, not have to get into that too much because it's just kind of disturbing yeah. it's it's hard because it is the time we live in you know and the things we have to talk about it some but at the same time it's nice to get a get a break agreed so tim let's just go ahead and go into personal updates we didn't talk about this a whole lot but uh christmas new year's how was it for you it was good it was a little different this year without um our son here you know when you don't have a when you 18 years, uh, you know, my wife has had this child and then him not be here. Uh, just didn't seem quite the same Christmas, but uh, we did get a letter from him really late on Christmas Eve, which was kind of our Christmas present uh, to get to hear from him. Any, any kind of uh, things, you know, we kind of hoped to get a call, which we did it on Christmas Day because we kind of hang out by the phone. And he, we did today it was the first time that I'd gotten to hear from him. That's pretty cool, and you got to do it during the live show, too. So Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so even though it was a different Christmas, it was still kind of a good Christmas. And, um, you know, we just, it's, I think you might have saw my Facebook post. It's like uh, 2020, I didn't didn't really, it's not about, you know, what I get for Christmas, more like what I already have. I learned to appreciate uh, things uh, very much, you know. And I think Thanksgiving just kind of spooled over into Christmas is more of a, I'm thankful, you know, uh, and I hear so many people that have lost jobs, and I still have a job, uh, still working plenty of hours, but at least I have a job and income coming in. So, uh, you know, it's hard not to be grateful, uh, even through everything. Absolutely. Now, I mean, kind of off topic, though, I mean, I guess in a way, but did you get any cool presents? I'm curious. You know, I did. Um, we, we bought a new car. I didn't know if you knew this. No, you didn't we, tell me that. Um, yeah, we, Man, now we should say before you before you continue here, Tim. Like, right? Like, I feel like like Christmas, the Wednesday before Christmas, like we turned off the lights on Arcade Repair Tips, and we just all like we just all cut off from the online social media and questions and everything. So I mean, like, and I even I mean I didn't talk to hardly anybody during that time. And I certainly didn't talk to you, and so I didn't get to find out all the cool stuff that you got or anything like that. But you got a new car. That's awesome. Well, it was kind of our, um, one for one, we needed one. Um, we actually gave away our car and um, to somebody that needed it. And because uh, we had my son's car to drive while he's in the military. But then it was decided, well, we're putting miles on his car. This wasn't the same. I'm going grocery shopping in a Mustang is just not very prudent. So we decided to maybe look a little. And, and we really, really did come across a good deal would you believe we found a used car with 80, not 8,000, 80 miles on it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> a, 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 what they call the corporate car, like somebody had bought in 2020, and because of the shutdown, they didn't. Uh, and so we were able to get as a certified pre-owned car with 80 miles on it. And uh, What is so it? It's a Mazda. Uh, I guess it's an MX-5. Or CX-5. CX-5, yeah, it's kind of a mid-size. Um, well, it, it, it's funny you mentioned that one because my uh, my sister bought a new one this year as well. So okay. Now hers has yeah. the hers has the um, heads-up dash that displays on the windshield. Have you seen that? No. Yeah, so like all of her gauges are like there, there's like a little LED thing that comes up and you see them on the windshield. You know, ours is the Grand Touring model, and be honest, we haven't even had a chance to fool with it it may even have that gotcha yeah no, she bought i about to say she bought like the tippy tippy top of the line on it so i don't know like what the models are or what the different variations and trim levels are on the cx-5 but um uh, she got the super whatever the top of the line was she got of the cx-5 and it's pretty cool and it's it, hers is decked out in all black what color did you end up getting it's white on the outside and has kind of a tan interior gotcha and of course, you know, we were more worried about, we had a Bose sound system, and we were trying to get the Sirius XM hooked up, you know. Absolutely. So that was in our focus. Uh, so, anyway, we, after we, we didn't, uh, of course, we didn't have a payment until uh, next month. You know, that'll start rolling in on us. 
but we just decided to keep it kind of simple. We bought a few gifts for our closest friends, and um, that was it. One one of the tools I will show you that I did. I've got some money mostly, and it was like, okay, we don't know what tool to buy you, so everybody just kind of gave me money, and I have money to buy stuff with. I haven't actually. I've been thinking about getting a router table, or uh, but I really need a bench vise too, a really heavy one. So I'm kind of leaning towards that. I, I'm just kind of sitting in my wallet until I run across something. But my daughter gave me something cool. If you can see this, I can kind of see it. It's kind of it's kind of uh, glitching yeah. out a little bit. Is it a pen? Yeah, it's a pen, and on it is on one side. I'll just go through it as a ruler. There is a level in here. Uh, you take off one end and it becomes a screwdriver uh, out one side and it's a stylus. So it's kind of a multi-function uh, tool pin, which I thought was pretty cool. It says it's an extreme pin. If anybody wants to Google where to buy one, I think it's kind of cool just to keep in my pocket at work. And it already has come in handy uh, several times. So um, that was out of that and some cash. Um, I've still got. I honestly thought I would go today, and it was so dreary and rainy here. I just kind of enjoyed a day off and watched some Netflix and news. So what about you, John? Um, my big my big gift was um, a new phone. So I got this is an LG Velvet. Uh, people who know me know I'm a huge LG fan, uh, just because their phones are cheap and they have a lot of good tech. They have a lot of cool tech in them. I really wanted the um, the Wing, the LG Wing. I don't know if you've seen that Tim, but that's the one that has the three screens. You swipe right here, and it comes. It kind of makes a T like this, and then it has a bottom screen under here. Um, but the Wing was, I think the Wing is a thousand dollars, and this was a hundred and fifty. So um, I'm better. I'm I'm okay with the Velvet for now. <laughs> so um, I got a really good deal on the velvet because usually it, it it's uh, much more than that. But uh, Walmart was running a special, so I was able to get it for for 150, which is a good price for a new phone, especially a flagship. So I'm um, happy about that. I uh, got some video games, uh, some Switch games because uh, I still like my Nintendo Switch. It's probably the thing I play the most. Uh, trying to think if there's anything else. I got a Pac-Man stool, which is actually sitting right here. I got a, a Ninja Turtles stool and an NBA Jam stool. Of course, all of those right. are the arcade one-up stools. Um, actually, maybe I can hold it up real quick. You guys can see it because it's kind of arcade related too, right? Here we go. So there's the there's the end of it. Can get oh. in there. Yeah. So it's actually I'm actually using it as my mouse pad for tonight. Oh, that's nice. But uh, yeah. So and I got I, I haven't put together the turtles or the NBA Jam one yet, but I'm um, looking forward to having those. Oh, it's good to have stools, nice stools in your game room, right, Tim? Oh yeah. You can't have too many of those. Exactly. So um, I think that was <clears throat> I think that was about it. I was trying to think if there was anything else that that I really could... the phone was like I said kind of my big gift and everything else was kind of just smaller stuff. But uh, I always like the smaller stuff too. So um, you know. But uh, yeah, that was about it. So I had a, it was a good Christmas. You know, um, always fun seeing the kids open their gifts. That was probably the most fun part of everything, of course. But. Um, uh, you know, just hanging out with family, friends, doing that kind of thing. Not not friends so much, I guess. Mostly just family. But um, uh, it, it was good. It was good. New Year's. Uh, we already talked about this, but we didn't talk about it to everybody in the live chat. I don't know what you guys did for New Year's. Let us know. I'm curious. But um, we just sat around here and put together Lego sets. We did we did talk about it a little bit, I think, in the live show. But uh, like I said, yeah. we put together Lego sets and uh, just had a had a good time. Watched uh, empty New York times square <laughs> area and everything like that which was kind of strange <laughs> so but um but you know other than that i thought uh, i thought it went great and uh watch the ball drop like always so it's good yeah, i thought that was kind of bizarre watching that without any people there that's what you normally see all this throngs of people absolutely yeah i mean it was it was very strange i mean it's the same way you know macy's thanksgiving day parade tim we watched that and there was nobody there and you know i mean you've kind of gotten used to not seeing crowds at different public events and things but uh still weird after you do it and you know my wife when we were watching it she's like well what did they do last year i was like sweetie last year everything was normal still right she had totally forgotten i mean that's how that's how long 2020 feels you know, I mean, God, it felt like it was forever. It felt, I mean, golly. So we forget that, I mean, January of last year, we had a normal birthday party for my son. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. At a place, at a public right. place where people go. And, you know, it's it's like, you can't do that now. You know, it's just different. So um, I, I did want to talk a little bit about my PlayStation 5 procure, procurement quest. Because I know last <laughs> time we had talked, um, I had not scored one. And I was staying up all hours of the night to get them. So, Tim, as of today... I have scored eight. Wow. Okay. 
Six of them have already found homes with people who are not scalpers who wanted to play the console, and I've sold every one that I have for what I paid for them. Okay. Now, some of those people paid me more, which I appreciate. I didn't ask for more. Um, but some people gave me a little bonus, which is always nice. But, Tim, uh, you know, this started out as just something that I was doing to help my sister-in-law and my coworker. And once I got theirs, I had kind of shut off all of my PS5, like, alerts and stuff like this, saying, okay, I'm done. But right. I ended up with that. I, I ended up with an extra digital copy because my coworker, uh, she wanted digital, and she ended up getting one the same time I got one. And so I ended up getting a an extra digital. And what I did was I posted on Facebook. I've got, and it was literally a week before Christmas. I posted on Facebook, "Hey, I've got a PS5 digital edition. If anybody wants it, just pay me what it's you know what it cost." And I had like 15 people respond to that. Uh, all at once and uh, I took it was first come first serve so the first person who had contacted me ended up getting that one but ever since then I, I felt like there was a need and so I've been continuing to get these PS5s for people who want them and selling them at regular normal retail price so scalpers they, <laughs> that's all I got to say Tim <laughs> So, um, but uh, I have been, I am still in the process. I, I think I need about two more disk systems and, until I've kind of fulfilled everybody. I had 15 people email me, but some of those people ended up getting their own um, now, which is great. Uh, and then some of those people decide they didn't want one. And so um, of the 15 that emailed me, it's probably only going to be about eight people who really need one. And uh -huh. so, like I said, I'm or about 10 people who really need one. So I'm really just looking for maybe two more and then I'm, I'm out. I'm not going to help people uh, find them anymore because, golly, I'm losing a lot of sleep and time over this. Um, but uh, it, it's ridiculous that they're so hard to get, Tim. It really is. I mean, it, they should not be this hard to get. And I feel and bad I, for these people who are looking for them. So, But, you know, I mean, the people who are the people who are uh, the, the scalpers who are taking advantage of people, though, come on, guys. I mean, it's 20... Have you seen all the hardship people have gone through this year? Don't you think people deserve a break? I'm just saying. I think so. So, you know, scalpers, guys, it's not, don't do it. Just don't do it. I'm sorry. So, no, I've been, I've been helping people procure them and not charging them any kind of, any kind of inflated pricing. Cause, cause like I said, they, it, they, people, if people want to play it, they should be able to play it. That's what it comes down to. So, um, the six people who have gotten there so far are very happy with them. So they've all worked, which is great, out of the mm -hmm. box, um, you know, and uh, and I've got, like I said, I bought two more today, and I'd actually texted you um, a, tw a tweet that somebody uh, I had saw, seen on Twitter saying it's easier to gain access to the Capitol building than it is to uh, buy a PS5 right now, <laughs> and that's, that was about, that was about, um, that's about right, and, um, but uh, like I said, I mean, I've been trying to help people, so um, I've got two more. If I can get two more after these last two that I bought today, then um, I think everybody will everybody will be satisfied, and everybody who wanted one will have one. So, um, uh, like I said, it, it's been it's been an adventure to say the least getting these things, and um, you know I'm glad that I'm able to help out a lot of people with it. But um, this this by far is the hardest thing I've ever tried to get, Tim. It's harder than the NES Classics. It's harder, you know. NES Classics were really hard to get there for a while. Um, I got more of those than I've gotten PS5 so far, and the PS5 is more expensive. That's something you have to remember. So, right. But um, you know, it's just ah. Uh, so I, I'm glad that I'm almost done with my PS5 quest. Um, I'm cutting off my waiting list, like I said, after the next two people. So um, if you want a PS5, um, I can give you the resources to get your own. I can show you my techniques. If you're following, uh, if you're on my Facebook page or if you're if you're a Facebook friend with me, I actually give a lot of tips on how to get them and how I get them. And so uh, if you're if you're looking for one, I can if you're looking for one, email questions at arcadepairtips.com and I'll send you the way that I get them so that way you'll know how I do it. But um uh Tim, again, it's been an adventure. So I'll leave it at that. It's fun. Um I see here um Let's see. Delusional says he did the same thing for the RTX 380 cards. Yeah, I see those. Um, the same people who are posting about like uh, PS5 stock uh, things are also posting about the graphic card stock. So I have seen quite, quite a few graphic cards for sale too. Tim, um, as you probably know, and this will kind of work into your investment talk, talk a little bit, Bitcoin is through the roof right now. It is crazy and still climbing. So here's the deal. People mine Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin is high... People want to start mining. And what's one of the things that really helps you with mining? Graphics cards. Those yeah. GPUs can process a lot of Bitcoin. So um, yeah. that's why you see graphics cards right now are very hard to get because it's not just gamers getting them. It's people who are building mining rigs as well. 
But this kind of works in, like I said, to your investment talk, Tim. Tell us a little bit about what you've been investing in. Is it Bitcoin? I don't know. Let us know. Well, I'm definitely not investing in energy stocks. Uh, that's kind of <laughs> on my low uh, totem pole right now. But yes, uh, there's also several stocks that follow Bitcoin. And uh, I've talked to you about this before. M-A-R-A and R-I-O-T are both uh, blockchain stuff that follow Bitcoin. Both I've been able to purchase for under $3, uh, and I stocked up when I saw Bitcoin going up. They're both about $17 and $15 right now. So that's good profit no matter what you're in. Uh, I remember one of our tips several months ago was that you could buy partial shares of Bitcoin. So even my $50 investment in Bitcoin has yielded five times that amount now. Uh, so that's another good thing. Uh, I do, uh, honestly, John, I, I don't know why exact. I know some of the reasons why, but um, I do think uh, I'll make a bold prediction that Bitcoin will probably go up to as high or over a hundred thousand. You really think this uh, year or or? Uh, I think within the next year, yeah. Wow. Um, that's a bold prediction. So, that's like um, that's a Jim Cramer Mad Money prediction right there, Tim. Well, you look at what it did last year and why it is being incredibly popular now. And there's. You can only mine what's out there. There's not any more being produced, uh, I guess, if you could say it that way. So it's not the the float on it stays the same. In other words, in other, there's not any more. There's not having any stock split or nothing like that. There's still only so many out there. So to obtain one, you've got to pay more to get that. It's kind of like if all the houses in the United States were built and there were no new homes being built. Um, the price of those homes would continue to rise as more people wanted to purchase. And so it's kind of become a um, social type deal for the people that can afford $40,000 and stuff at a time. Uh, it's becoming more popular. Uh, there's a lot of rumors out about uh, people accepting them as currency. I think you'll see more of that coming out in the next year. And as it does, with as little acceptance as it has now, I think that it will at least double. Uh, we'll see if that happens. So uh, still not a bad investment even for small dollar amounts. Yeah, and let's talk uh, with Bitcoin, Tim. Um, you, you know, the thing about it is, is that the mining usually lags behind the uptick. And so like, like you're saying right now, there may be a limited amount. But as people, what's going to happen now is people are going to have more mining rigs. And so there's going to be more, there's going to eventually, the demand will, will kind of sort of try to catch up to the supply, but it's going to take a while. Um, and, right. and if the demand can, continues to go up, like you're thinking it will, I don't think the supply will ever be able to catch it. And so if that's the case, I think it will continue to go up. I don't know for sure. I'm not bold enough to say that that's going to happen like you are, but um, I would not be surprised if it was the case. So. I have done a lot of research lately. I'm not throwing that out. I'm saying that it's definitely a, a guess and a prediction, but at the current rate, it would hit that in a year. Wow. Okay. And that oh, you heard it here, guys. That's uh, that's uh, Tim Kramer's. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that it's his projection. We'll see how it works out for him. But um, it, there's no doubt right now, though, that Bitcoin is high. Tim. I mean, we all remember when Bitcoin was like below ten thousand. And so, yeah, yeah, so if you would have bought, like, when it, even, even less than, well, less than a year ago, right? It was below that. Yeah. So, I mean, if you would have bought in then, like you said, and what you'd have now, you'd be, yeah, about five times what you were at, so. Yeah, I bought $50. It's worth $250 right now, yep. or more. So, I mean, so, now it just goes to show you. How to turn some of that into. So, another thing that you can expect to rise, and is already rising, is our cannabis stock. Uh, because they feel like they have the votes now to possibly pass some more legislation um, with a Democrat-controlled uh, Congress. So I would expect some of those to go up. Um, I would also, anything to do with electricity as a Green New Deal will probably be passed. Electric vehicles are still hot. Um, uh, wasn't know, it the, Massachusetts that is now putting a limit on when they say gas power vehicles are going to stop gas power vehicles? Was it Massachusetts? It was another state that announced, I think 2035, they want they didn't want any more uh, gas powered vehicles. Yep, and that seems to be the date. 
And that sounds so far away, but we are as close to 2035 as we are going backwards to 2005. Think of that. So most everybody here remembers 2005, and that doesn't seem like that long ago, so it won't be long we'll be driving uh, electric cars only. I do think that more states may follow that. Uh, so looking for alternative energy is definitely hot right now. Uh, YouTube Punk says but, uh, uh, cannabis yeah. stock is high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In more ways than one, right? And, uh, right. So, you know, even our investment went down to almost $5, and it almost hit $10 again. So it is almost back at the level that we bought it, uh, which, gosh, has been probably uh, two years ago. I don't, I'm not sure on the date. I have to look that up, Jonathan. But anyway, to be made... Uh, if you're, uh, you know, if you're in the oil and gas industry, you, you may uh, see some recline in that industry, but there'll still be, you, you know, even electric windmills use oil, uh, Jonathan, about, uh, and so even uh, electric power comes from a lot of gas-powered plants. So uh, there's still some money to be made there. Just be careful, I would say, on that front. Um, still a lot of... of things to do with COVID and vaccinations and things to come down the pipe. Um, it may be a good time to buy uh, in some other areas, uh, hoping for a better day while things are down uh, for when things improve. Absolutely. Uh, YouTube punks are, excuse me, uh, Delusionals Arcade says Massachusetts cannot buy gas vehicles is what it is. You won't be able to buy a gas vehicle uh, in after 2035 or whatever it is okay. so um but still i mean basically that's them doing away with them right i mean that's what it comes down to so i guess you could always hop the state line buy one bring it back over correct i guess so mm -hmm. but, yeah. anyway bootleg, who ever thought a bootleg vehicle would be dead <laughs> you never i uh weirder things have happened tim there you go now uh, i put sports talk on here next tim but i don't know if there's anything to talk about i will say that uh, i'm a big texas football fan as you know and we kicked tom herman out and we got a steve what's his name from alabama now as the head coach i don't know how that's going to work out but it is uh, something is there anything else you want to talk about well you know my team of course won their bowl game pretty big after uh, Florida said that we weren't in their league, it's kind of a good thing because it seems like a lesser league. <laughs> at the forum. Uh, no, um, one thing I want to talk about though, talking about bowl games, and I want to get your opinion. I was really, uh, it was a shallow victory though. We beat Florida 55 to 20. Florida was out 13 players, I think it was. Now some were sick and injured. I think about six of them, but seven of them I think chose to sit. Um, this has been a big topic of discussion. Um, I, I have a real problem with that. I don't want to get hurt. I'm fixing to enter the draft, so I'm not going to play in my bowl game. Um, how are you? How do you? I, I could probably guess on how you feel about that, John. But I really, uh, Mac Brown's team um, played in their first bowl game in 28 years, and four of their best players set out and basically cost them that game, I, I do believe. And Matt Brown, I think, is a great coach for North Carolina, and he said it. He said, had they told me earlier we might have could have prepared for this, I wasn't expecting this, so many players at the last minute decided not to play, I'm not in agreement with it. He said, I do understand their point of view, but he says, what he's asking, what can we do about this? And his answer is to go to more of a playoff system where – the games seem to matter more, where they actually could keep winning and play for a national championship. I don't think a, uh, for instance, Oklahoma winning the Cotton Bowl this year, uh, it's a nice trophy, but nobody from Oklahoma is that excited as much as they would be that they didn't get to play for a national championship. Personally, I feel it was better to take a Cotton Bowl victory than to get beat soundly by Alabama or Ohio State. Um, I like the victory. I like the, what it does for a young team. I think it encourages them. Uh, but even a lot of some of their players are opting opted. A couple of player players, I think, opted not to play. Um, how do you feel about that, John? I mean, for me, I mean, yes, I wish they would play. But I mean, the the problem is that schools don't. I don't really. At that point, they're not getting anything to 
to play. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they've already kind of fulfilled their obligations with the school as far as that's concerned. It's kind of like their last game of the year. If they're going into the draft, they're not going to, I mean, there's nothing, there's really no benefit for them to play is what I would say. So unless there's, unless you're going to give them some benefit to play, I mean, I, if I was in their position, I'd do the same thing. Now, would I like to see them play? Yes. But I mean, it's like if there's no benefit for me and I have the possibility of getting injured and then going lower in the NFL draft, I mean, you got. I mean, you kind of have to look at for your future at that point, don't you? Now, if a school says, "Hey, we're gonna, we'll give you some sort of bonus for playing the bowl game," you know, what I'm saying I don't know, like doesn't have to be cash necessarily, but we'll give you something for playing the bowl game and encouraging them to do that. I, I think that may go a long way. But and I understand school pride and all that kind of stuff too. I mean, this this is a team you've played for all year or maybe for four years, depending. Um, I understand that too. But I mean, you know, when you're looking at you know, NFL careers are so short, Tim, and you don't want to go into your NFL career injured. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's not like baseball where you can play for 30 years. Um, right. You know, if you only maybe have 10 years as an NFL player, I mean, unless you're out, an, some outstanding athlete like a Drew Brees or a, a, a Tom Brady. But if you're not that, you may have a good 10 years. You may, and probably shorter than that. Do you really want to go into your the NFL draft being injured in a bowl game is the question I'd ask you. Yeah, I, I'm I'm the opposite though, John. Maybe this would be our debate topic for tonight <laughs> in, in the after show, because there's two things that motivate people. You're right; they can't pay them anything. So my my opposite would be fear. You agree to come to our program and to compete at the highest level and to help us win bowl games. That's how our school gets money. That's how the women's tennis team is funded. Uh, because of the the money that we get playing in these bowl games. There's a lot of money involved mm -hmm. that's spread out. So if you don't play, how about we just rescind your scholarship and you could pay us back for the last year that you uh, cost us money. Um, so, you know, I'm the opposite. I would think that you're costing your school money and revenue that they need, whether it may, you say, well, they may not need it, a football program might need it, but... Like I said, the bowling team needs it, the track team needs it, uh, the women's basketball team needs it. They're not bringing in that kind of money. The money's coming from these schools playing in these, these big bowl games and getting payouts. So although it is unfair to the student athlete, uh, maybe they could come up with something uh, or um, – I don't know. It, 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 it's a tough topic. I really think that... Or, I mean, just make the last game of the... I mean, instead of doing it like this, make it... Make it... Make the bowl games a part of the regular season where you have bowl, different bowl games every week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously it's always a big deal when Oklahoma and Texas play. You can make that... I mean, you know, we, we have a... You know, there's a name for it, but you can make that like an actual bowl game. Uh, but have yep. the bowl games actually during the season instead of having them all at the end of the season after everybody's already played. But, you know, I mean, do something different because, I mean, like I said, at this point, it, I mean, you're done. I mean, you already know you're not in the playoff or you're in the playoff. So what right. is there to play for left except a bragging bowl win, you know? And maybe it is time then that we revisit the thought of playing uh, college athletes at least something. And then a bonus for winning a bowl game or being in a bowl game or playing in a bowl game. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't have to talk about millions of dollars, but to a college athlete, 100 bucks a week or something or $500 a week would be the world of difference between, you know. Well, I, and then, now, Tim, think about this. When I was in college, I worked my way through, right? I had, I had a, sure. a part-time job, plus I went to college, okay? If you're a student athlete, you can't do that. No. You can't get hard. a part-time job because you know what you're doing? You're a practice. Mm -hmm. And so I think they should be paid something, like you said, not millions of dollars necessarily, but I mean, why not at least pay them, you know, I mean, maybe minimum wage at least, because I mean, everything else is taken care of for them as far as their housing, their tuition a lot of times, but minimum yeah. wage would at least give them some money to use for other things if they needed to, so. Yeah, something, something that, or like Mac Brown said, maybe a, a further deeper playoff to where it encouraged players to play. Because none of the players that play in, are playing in the national championship game are setting out. Right, exactly. Because that's the national championship game. Right, but at the same time, does it, it, it does it to your school though? Uh, you know, like I said, North Carolina has not been a bowl game in like 28 years. A bowl game. They haven't played in the Blue Bonnet, the you know the um, 
bear bear aspirin bowl or nothing. <laughs> they played in squat if I read if I if I know that history right. Uh, so it was a huge deal. Get to play in the Orange Bowl. Imagine what you know players 28 years ago would have done to get to play in the Orange Bowl. And to me, it says something. If I'm an NFL scout or picking somebody, I'm going to say this guy is more concerned about himself than his team. Is this the guy I really want on my team? Uh, when it still takes a lot of teamwork, and you want somebody that's going to say, "Well, I'm going to set out." Um, now because we're not going to make the playoffs. Right. Uh, where does this end? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, but like I said, I think I think we should pay them something. I'm not saying you pay them millions of dollars. I think they should have a stipend. And maybe, like you said, if you get to a bowl and, you know, if you win the bowl game, you get a bonus. Just a little bonus. I'm not talking, again, not talking millions of dollars. But, you know, what would it, like, every player gets, like, an extra 500 bucks. I mean, or $1,000 even, you know? Stimulus check for the players. Yeah, there. exactly. So then it's like, well, if I don't play, I don't even have the opportunity to get the, the bonus. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're not talking about big money for them because, I mean, the school is putting up their tuition. They're putting up they're putting up their, their room and board in a lot of cases. But there's something about having a little spending money. I had that because I was able to work. So Yeah, I think so. So, yeah. Oh. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, but as it is now, I don't blame them. Like I said, if you were in the same position, Tim, if you were in the same position, let's say you're going to be a high NFL draft pick you're, and your team did not make it into the playoff, I mean, would you play or would you not? It, I, personally, I know me. I would play because I feel like it's important. I joined that team. It's kind of like wanting to quit halfway during the season. And I would know you need to stick it out because you made a commitment to your team. If your team earned a bowl bid, I don't care if what bowl it is. Um, you know, if it's, then I would play in that game and be a part of my teammates and let them know that they mean something to me. And it might not, there's, you know, 90% of them may never go on to play um, NFL or, or play past that point, but it would give me, and it'd be one more opportunity to spend a minute on those guys with those fields. But that's me. Well, you see, but like I said, let's say that, let's say you play in that game and you're a quarterback and you get Joe Montana. No. Okay, and it, it's a five-year rehab process. You come back, they pick you. Somebody picks you up for their practice team in the NFL. You never make it again. Let's say without that injury, you would have made. You would have been a top ten pick. You know what I'm well, saying? I mean, that's that's tough. That's tough. That's well, what I'm saying. Maybe maybe the solution then is John that we have insurance for college players who are hurt and can't play football for the rest of their lives, and you say, well. You know, maybe there's an insurance that they could, they maybe instead of paying them, they could pay their insurance just in case you do get hurt. Then uh, maybe you're guaranteed so much money because you're no longer able to play and you were predicted to, I don't know, there had to be some way to, um, to do mean, that. But I, the average player, what if you get hurt and you can't have a different kind of job? I think insurance is, but well, I'm with you. I think insurance is a great idea. What you do is you figure out what their draft position would be, what their rookie salary would be under their rookie contract, and you insure for that amount. See what I'm well, saying? Like a, so whatever the slot money is, wherever they get drafted, plus whatever their rookie contract money would be, you insure for that amount. Right. And, well, and say that's what they would get. So they wouldn't get, you know, I mean, typically you don't make a ton of money on your rookie contract, but you're going to make something. And it a lot of pe- for a lot of people, that'd be enough for it to it would be enough to, to help them through any kind of rehab that they needed uh, up to that point and, ha- and probably have some left over as well. I think they need to listen to us, John. We <laughs> can discuss it. Have a, see, this is what the whole world needs. Good organized discussion, come out with good ideas. I think it's a good idea. An insurance policy um, for their players that play in, the, in those games. And in any game. It could be in a game in the second thing of the season. Why wouldn't you have insurance for your player because let's say that their goal was to leave college and they wanted to be a business person, but their knee is taken out and they wake up in pain the rest of their life. And they can't be a good business person because of the pains that they feel. Maybe they deserve the compensation, too, for any player to get hurt, not just a draft pick. Absolutely. Okay, we'll leave it there. Uh, fascinating discussion, Tim. But um, I will say that I have been watching the Mavericks basketball uh, a little bit, Dallas Mavericks play. It's been good. Um, if you haven't seen Luka Doncic play, you're, no, you, you need to do it because, I mean, he's he's the next big thing, boy. This he is be awesome. The season. Yeah. I mean, you, if you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor. If your team's playing the Mavericks, tune in. 
I promise. Yeah. You won't regret mm-hmm. it. And then, uh, Tim, the uh, hockey is about to start back up, middle of January. Looking forward to that. Stars hockey again. Maybe we'll get that Stanley Cup. We were so close last year. Maybe this year will be our year. Never know. So, um, Tim, a couple of cord-cutting uh, things. I don't know if you're a fan of all the Discovery networks, but now there's Discovery Plus is a thing, which is a new Roku yeah. channel with all the Discovery content on it. So if you're a fan of you know HGTV, uh, Food Network, or any of the other Discovery channels, all most of their content is going to be on Discovery Plus. And I believe it has the same... The same pay structure as Peacock, which is five dollars for an ad supported yeah. tier, and then ten dollars for a non ad, for no ad tier. So, if you're looking for um, discovery content, you can go there. Peacock now has all the episodes of The Office for those people who are looking for those because they're no longer on Netflix, and you can sign up for Peacock uh, on their service. Again, same pricing: five dollars for an ad supported model, ten dollars without. So, <laughs> but Tim, the big news that came out, I, I think I sent it to you, and I even said game changer. Um, because very few things are ever really a game changer, but this was, and that was the fact that um, Warner Brothers was going to was going to basically put all their movies on HBO Max, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, basically, it means you don't have to go to the movie theater to see a Warner Brother movie for the next twelve months. And I probably won't. Yeah, if you've got HBO Max, you don't need to. And Tim, of course, the first of those movies was Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four, which we're about to get to. We're, but before we talk about that, I want to talk about all the things we saw separately before we talk about the two things that we saw together. So besides Wonder Woman and the Bee Gees documentary on HBO Max, what else have you been watching? Um, I just finished last night the documentary on D.B. Cooper. So I, I have this, I was about to say, I have this on my list. Is it good? Yeah, it, what it is, it basically, um, every, I hope everybody knows the story of D.B. Cooper. If not, uh, it'd be worth watching. So you could. My wife was a little tiny bit familiar, but she really didn't know much about it. I've known about it for years, ever since the 80s when they found some of the money, which has always made it interesting. What it is, they have five people that they think could be D.B. Cooper. And, uh, of course, I think they're all dead right now. And uh, they go back and look at people that have claimed it, like on their deathbed confession or... After their death, their wife comes forward and says, I discovered I didn't even know my husband had all these aliases, or one had a sex change. I didn't realize that my dad, who turned into a female, why he did it. Uh, And they kind of present their case on who could be D.B. Cooper. And uh, they interview the pilot, the uh, flight attendant that sat beside him, and uh, when he basically laid out his plan, uh, to uh, st- to get the money and stuff and how it all went down. So it's really interesting. And then you can kind of guess, uh, We'll maybe we'll talk about it next month after you watch it, Jonathan. I'm pretty sure one of those people actually was D.B. Cooper. Oh, nice. I, I mean, and there's three of them that I say it really could have been. And uh, so... Uh, the FBI has actually closed the case on it, but after some of the stuff that come up, I'm like, I can understand why their family feels my relative was D.B. Cooper. And so they all have compelling points that could be, but one in particular to me, I think, was uh, like, well, oh, that probably was him. Nice. And uh, she really didn't have any clue. She didn't even have a clue who D.B. Cooper was until after he had gone and told her right on his deathbed, by the way, I'm Dan Cooper. And so anyway, guys, if you like that conspiracy type stuff, uh, if you just like the history or a good documentary, uh, well shot. It actually reenacts a lot of scenes. I like those, I like those documentaries that kind of reenact it, not just sitting there people talking stories. They do some good reenactments of it and show stuff, so you would like it, John. Okay, well, it's on my list. I'll have to give it a watch now. Now, Tim, you recommended something last month, and I am in the process of watching, and that is The Queen's Gambit. Okay. And it is very good. I am three episodes in. Me and my wife are, and so far, I love it. It's going to really get good then. Okay, good. I mean, it's um, very well done. Uh, Enjoying every minute of it. Really love it. So, uh, Tim, what else? Is there anything else you've been watching other than the two that we're going to discuss here in a bit? No, not besides them two, because I have really been into uh, the old episodes of Wonder Woman, and there's a lot of them. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. it was, yeah. Linda but, Carter style, right? They are really long. There's about 40 minutes, and I guess they were hour long they show were. back then. Yep. 
And uh, so I've uh, been really watching those, and that's kind of taken up my spare time. I haven't even started Cobra Kai Season 3 yet, which is a shame. Finished. Fantastic. Okay. Not spoiling anything. Just watch right. it. Um, watch it. I, okay. Look, I don't know how they could make it better. The only thing... The only thing is, I mean, where it ends, I understand where they ended it, but I really wanted them to go further. I was hoping that, I mean, you've seen season two, right? Yeah. Okay, quick spoiler for season two. I was really hoping that, like, the whole battle between uh, between Johnny and and uh, Kreese and, and uh, Daniel was all going to happen. Like, they were going to have that battle this yeah. season. They don't. So that's your okay. spoiler. They, I was really hoping for, like, that... One like gigantic battle between everybody, but they're holding that back for season four. It's already it's already been um, renewed, so okay. I mean. But here's the deal: don't let don't sleep on season three just because of that, because a lot of stuff happens and all of it's fantastic, and the cameos are fantastic. That's it. Okay. <laughs> watch it, and then next month we'll talk about it. Watch it now. Okay. So I'll watch. It's all you know. It's only like five hours because each episode's only like thirty minutes, and there's ten of them. So. I honestly know that the day I'll start watching, I better have five hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna want to go through. That's almost today, and I just could not get. I had something else come up and couldn't do it. Right. So it's very good. You got to do it. Um, Queen's Gambit, like I mentioned before, uh, Tim, you recommended it, and that was a great recommendation. It's great. Um, The Mandalorian season two, Tim. Yeah. And golly, another thing that is just fantastic. Golly, the end of season two is amazing. Amazing. Okay. So, I, man, I want to spoil so bad, but I can't. <laughs> uh, let's see. A couple other things that that aren't um, sequels or season twos or anything. Um, so I watched Hillbilly Elegy on Netflix. You know this, Tim? I've been wanting to watch that, yeah. So um, I, I may have mentioned this last time. I can't remember. But um, it was directed by Ron Howard. Uh-huh. It's got Amy Adams in it. And right. it's got uh, Glenn Close in it. And okay. it is fantastically acted. Um, it's a true story about a uh, you know about this boy who grew up to be a very respected lawyer, but kind of had a, a tough upbringing. Um, it's very well shot. I mean, very well could be an award-winning movie. Um, wow. I, I, I have a feeling it'll be nominated. I don't know if it's going to win any, but it is fantastic. Yeah, you should watch it. Just you know, right. just just you know, kind of uh, section off two hours of your time and give it and watch it. Because that's very good. That was Netflix, right? Netflix, correct. So you don't have okay. to you don't have to pay anything extra for that one. Um, speaking of HBO Max, the other show we watched was The Undoing with Hugh Grant and Nicole Kidman. Okay. It's a murder mystery t- style show, um, and there's a lot of you know red herrings to lead you to believe certain people did it, and uh, it's fantastically acted because you have two great actors. Plus, you have Donald Sutherland. Okay, huh? and he is fantastic. Golly, that guy can act. Um, he he puts uh, Hugh Grant and uh, and Nicole Kidman to shame. I mean, my personal opinion. And I'm a big yeah. Kiefer Sutherland fan. I I'm a huge Twenty Four fan, as people know. But Donald Sutherland, good lord, that guy can act. So okay. I mean, he makes you believe it. He makes you believe it. So um, so it's recommended it, then. Good yes, movie. Yes, it's very good. It's very good. So if you like murder mystery stuff, you'll like it. So, oh yeah. And I can give you like the synopsis. She's a psychiatrist. He's an oncolo- uh, a child oncologist that deals with cancer cancer pa- patients. Um, a woman ends up dead. They got to figure out who did it. Okay. So and Hugh Grant is accused. I'll tell you that much. So, okay. Um, but um, so that's the whole premise of it. If you've seen the trailer, I told you exactly what was in the trailer. So. But um, okay. So let's get down to the two that you and me both watched. Starting with the first, the Bee Gees documentary on HBO Max, Tim. Um, so I watched this um, before Christmas, I think. Um, what did you think of it? Well, you know, to me, when I, when I think of BGs, my first thought is staying alive. Just the movie. And it really went way back. That It got to that point. But there was so much that was really good before that. I didn't, you know, I, I just forgot some of the BGs hits, you know, and... Um, it was like, oh, yeah, the Bee Gees sang that. And then to hear, you know, kind of their struggles. And I never, to be honest, really understood what happened to them. What kind of what killed Disco. If you want to know that, that could have been the name of the documentary. And how I did not realize, because we were, or at least I was really young at the time. Um, I didn't realize how quickly it happened. All within a couple of weeks. They went from being on top of the world to 
every show canceled. I'm, I'm not spoiling anything. If you you know, it is it, what it is, right? Yeah, it is what it is. I mean, it's just like and how all that went down. I had no idea. And can you imagine what it was like for them? That's what you really get out of it is what it was like for them to go from being so famous and then to just step back and saying we didn't really ever want the fame we want to um we just love music and to go on and write the songs they did you know um i never knew they wrote islands in the stream by dolly parton uh and kenny rogers i didn't realize that was a very good written song then they start listing all these songs that were like number one hits that they wrote during this time when they didn't want to be the Bee Gees, the disco group. That and how they had to change their music up and how they um, focused with life's tragedies and things that happened to them, which was all very sad. Um, but uh, but very 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 good. If you're even a remote fan, even if you hate disco, I think you would enjoy the documentary. And, uh, of course, I, I loved it. Uh, me and my wife both enjoyed watching it together. Oh, I loved it, too. And, Tim, that's slightly ahead before my time, the Bee Gees. Um, but I have a big affinity for them anyway because I, like I like good music, and I feel like the Bee Gees was good music, regardless of what people think. And it really shows, Tim, theirs was a true roller coaster ride with high highs and low lows. Um, yeah. Like, in the beginning, I mean, they gained popularity before even Saturday Night Fever happened, before right. the, the album did. They were pretty popular. Um, but yeah. not as popular as they were after Saturday Night Fever came out. That was like the pinnacle, right? But even before that, they kind of had this upward career, and then it kind of came down. And then right before Saturday Night Fever, it started going up again, and then it just hit like the highest high that you could think of after the Saturday Night Fever um, came out. And so, um, but the whole story is, is amazing. And like you said, it just it just goes to show you, I mean, like you said, these guys weren't looking to make quote-unquote disco music. They just wanted to make good music. And guys... I don't care who you are. The Saturday Night Fever soundtrack is still fantastic. I have I have the actual record. It is still good. I, I can put it on. You can listen to the whole thing. The music is still good. So, I mean, and I know, like you said, what really brought them down was this whole revolt against disco and how, you know, basically people wanted hard rock. They didn't want the disco stuff. And there were so many DJs and things that were anti-disco. It really killed the entire movement. And they were so associated with that movement you know, that it killed them with it. All right. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's sad from that point of view. But like you said, they had a whole third career, really, writing music for people and yeah. doing a fantastic a job writing songs. What would you say? A very successful one. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, yeah. people don't yeah. realize that. What they wrote songs for is amazing. Yeah, tons of hits, tons of hits written after after the beaches. And Tim, you know, I back in the '90s, I bought the Still Waters um, Bee Gees album that they released, um, uh -huh. which was later, and that was actually a good album too. People, um, uh -huh. and I, I bought that like when it first came out. I, I bought that uh, that CD the same day I bought Hell Freezes Over with the Eagles, and I felt wow. like, man, I'm so '70s right now. I didn't even realize it. So, um, but both those albums were really good, and the Bee Gees music is still good. I mean, it's still it's still good. So I mean. Anyway, that's my opinion. And it's a great documentary, regardless of what you think of the Bee Gees themselves, because it really does show kind of the ups and downs of the music industry and how you can be up for a while and you can be down for a while. You can be up for a while and then back down. And, you know, it was just amazing how they went, like you said, in a matter of really weeks from being on top of the world to being nobodies and nobody wanted to book them. Nobody wanted to hire them. Yeah. And did you catch it, John, that they actually didn't always sing falsetto either? No, they didn't. Yeah, which is really interesting that they kind of did it in one song and the music producer liked it and was like, oh, yeah. Jive talking. Thing. That's right. Yeah. They, 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 they put a little bit of falsetto in there and they liked it. And I tell you, I mean, their falsetto, I mean, as far as falsetto goes, it's, it's some of the best. And it gives it a kind of groovy sound. I like the way it sounds. So uh -huh. not everybody can get away from, with singing falsetto, Tim. I definitely can't. But no, uh, if you can't, I mean, if anybody could, it was definitely the Gibbs, man. They had it. So, but cool stuff. Great documentary. Regardless of if you're a fan of the Bee Gees, you should watch it. Tim, Tim and Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. Yeah. Two thumbs up on that one. Now, we may disagree on Wonder Woman. We'll see. So let's go ahead and get to the main event, Tim. Wonder Woman 1984. I watched it on Christmas Day at night after all the festivities. Uh, when did you watch it? I watched it that night also. Okay. So, uh, what'd you think? 
you know, I I don't, especially after going back and watching some of the original um, shows, it was so cheesy back then that that's kind of what I wanted and expected, and it was. It was kind of cheesy, um, and but I liked it. Entertaining. Um, was I glad I didn't take the whole family and shell out 50 bucks at the movies? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I, I, it was definitely cheesy. I loved it. I mean, I, I mean, I, I thought it was. Very, I liked it more than the first one, and I liked the first one. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I like the cheesiness of it. I, I'm tired of kind of the serious superhero movie sometimes, and I like yeah. the fact that this kind of leaned heavily into the '80s. I mean, if you think about it, um, the wish, the wish stone, or whatever, dreamstone, the dreamstone. I'm, 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 quick spoiler: the dreamstone kind of lends itself to that decade of you know opulence, right? Yeah, I mean, it kind of lends itself to to the time period. I thought that was brilliant writing. Um, I don't want to spoil too much. Um, there was a scene in the arcade that had two games that weren't that were manufactured after 1984. Tim, uh, the Operation Wolf and the Rampage. I don't know if you noticed that, but yes, that, see, that's the problem. That uh, when you, if I wasn't thinking of it being cheesy, that wouldn't have bothered. It, it, that would have bothered me, but it didn't bother me because I was like, eh. You know, yes, I was looking at going, 1984, wait a second, there's Rampage. I knew that right off the bat. Right. But it really didn't mess with me or keep me from enjoying the show, you know. But other people are just like, oh, my gosh, how could you not get that right? I, I thought it was neat uh, being said in 1984. There was, I found a lot of things in there that weren't 1984. Yeah, but, one, of, uh, one of my favorite parts of the entire movie, and this isn't spoiling too much, I think it's in the trailer, is when her boyfriend's doing like the, the fashion montage where he's trying on all the different outfits and some of the commentary that they make about the uh-huh. different outfits. I, I love that part. Oh, me too. I so, thought it was great. Yeah, that part and, is, is fantastic. It's one of my favorite parts. Yeah, me too. And another thing that was funny, though, was we were watching the old, real episode of Wonder Woman, Linda Carter, and it showed Paradise Island, and I paused the frame on my TV, and I said, look at what's in the background. And in the background, there was a trailer, like the movie trailer, on wheels and everything. They're supposed to be on this exotic island. (laughs) Clearly right there, and there were cars driving around the street. I was like, they didn't even edit that out back then. That just made it even funnier to me. You know, it's like, okay, you're on Paradise Island. There's a trailer in the background, like a, like a a, a long old '80s, uh, '70s trailer. You know, like your grandma <laughs> lived in or something. You know, it was funny. Yeah, you see, I think people wanted this to be more serious, kind of like the first Wonder Woman, and I think a lot of people were disappointed that it wasn't. But like I said, I'm kind of past the serious stuff yeah as far as that i want something that's fun you know and i felt like it was a fun movie that's exactly how i felt it was just fun so uh youtube punk says his wife's a huge wonder woman fan but hates this version of wonder woman i i i like gal gadot personally i think she's i think she's an excellent actress i think she actually plays wonder woman kind of like what you would think wonder woman would actually be like uh in my opinion um so i mean for me for me, I, I, I'm fine with her. I know there's a lot of Wonder, maybe, you know, Wonder Woman fans that are like, oh, she's terrible if you read the comic books or whatever. But to me, I, I think she plays the part fine. And like I said, she's able to do all the action sequences and stuff. And they, every, man, I tell you what, like the action sequences were fantastic, I thought. Mm-hmm. Like um, some the fight in the mall was one of my favorites when she's busting up the thugs. Um, you'll see yeah. that if you see it. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, and like I said, it was cheesy. Yes, it was cheesy. Okay, is this like one of my top ten movies ever? Absolutely not. Okay, did I like it? Did I have fun watching it? Yes, I did. And I'll probably watch it again at some point. Yeah, me too. I'll probably watch it again. I've got the first Wonder Woman on Blu-ray. I'm going to buy this one probably too once it comes out. I I mean, I I had fun watching it. And I, like you said, it's a superhero movie. You have to kind of, you have to kind of, you know, suspend some of your disbelief a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, it is what it is, guys. It's not a, you know, I know Marvel may have spoiled us a little bit, Tim, with the way that they've got all these serious interconnected stories and everything is, you know, everything is woven together and all this kind of stuff. I just take this movie for what it is. I don't think about the rest of the DC universe or anything like that. And for what it was, I enjoyed it. It was fun. And I, I, I stayed up to the whole thing, even though I was very tired uh, and we watched it late at night, which I think is a testament to it as well. So, and it's long. It ain't short. Right, it is. 
So, um, but I thought the writing was pretty clever. I, I mean, some of the stuff was a little janky as far as like connecting stuff together. Um, and I don't want to get into that too much because there's a lot of spoilers there that I don't want to give away. But, um, um, you know, the, you know, it's just, you know, some of the things, and I think you could probably point them out too, Tim, if we really talked about it, but there were some, there was some jankiness in certain parts with the way that they introduced, how they shoehorned some characters in there and stuff like that, that I didn't feel was really great. But, um, other than that, I thought, I thought it was good. So I enjoyed it. I don't know. I'm with you though. I don't know if I would have shelled out. 50 bucks or whatever it is to go see it and get popcorn and everything. But, um, you know what? I've gone to a Saturday matinee, you know, early matinee and seen it probably. So, yeah. And walked away thinking I had a good time. Yeah, exactly. And if look, you should watch it. I mean, you know, HBO max is, um, Tim, you should get HBO Max for the entire year because, I mean, the, the new Mortal Kombat movie is going to be coming out this year. The new Matrix movie is going to be coming out this year. Um, there's going to be a ton of Warner Brothers movies that you're going to be able to watch on HBO Max. 15 bucks a month. I know it's a little pricey. It's around Netflix zone. But, Tim, I, I mean, you've only used it for two weeks, but it kind of is a Netflix replacement in a way, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. It's got, a, and it's got some of those older shows and stuff on it like I'm really enjoying watching. Yeah, so I mean, if you're making a decision be between HBO Max and, and Netflix, I really feel like you could go month to month and switch every month. Yeah. So like one month you do HBO Max, you watch all the content on there. The next month you do Netflix and you watch all the content on there and just switch back and forth or do six months of HBO Max, six months of, of um, Netflix, and then you don't have to miss out on anything. You know what I'm saying? Maybe so. Because, I mean, the content on both, both of these um, both of these um, services are cranking out some excellent content. Tim, I'm looking forward to watching the... Um, uh, the Flight Attendant on HBO Max. I've heard really good things about that. Uh, oh, that looks good. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, that's on my list of things to watch. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is on there. There's a lot of different things that I'm looking forward to watch on HBO Max, including the movies coming up. So, um, you know, I, like I said, why not switch back and forth? One month you do HBO Max, next month you do Netflix, HBO Max, blah, 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 blah. I, I think if you did that, you'd kind of get the best of both worlds. And Because here's the deal. there. I mean, there's... I mean, unless you're like us and you have kids that watch Netflix all the time, there's months where you, you may not even watch anything on Netflix or months where you may not watch anything on HBO Max. If you switch back and forth, like I said, every time, you just kind of get the best of both worlds as you're switching. So, Or two months of HBO Max, two months of, of Netflix, blah, blah, blah. So, Yeah, who knows? <laughs> but um, I'm glad you're enjoying Are you, You're still technically in the trial I gave you, correct? Yeah. Okay. Did you sign up for that on, on Christmas Eve or was it a little bit before that? Um, christmas day oh christmas day okay gotcha so um so yeah so you're you're nearing the end of your two-week trial so yeah <laughs> well here's the deal are you an eight you're an at&t wireless customer yeah do you have one of their newer unlimited plans yeah like the elite plus or whatever it is i think so you, you should get it. hbo max for free then okay That's um if you're on one of the the current unlimited plans you should get hbo max for free I'll check into that. If you're I'm not, really if you're not, you could train. You could actually um, move to one of those and get it for free. Okay. So, um, but you may call AT and T and talk to them and say, "Hey, um, is there something I can?" Because here's the deal: when I went with HBO Max, it actually lowered my bill. When I went with the new unlimited plan, it actually lowered my bill. Wow. And now I get HBO Max for free. So, um, so it may be worth it for you to do that. You may call them up. Okay, I'm tired. Are you ready you to may- go to bed? You gotta wake up earlier than I do. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we've already established that earlier, you know, earlier in the show. I know that feels like it was in 2020, but it was just like two hours ago. I promise. Yeah. So anyway, well, guys, we we want to thank everybody for uh, staying up late with us and watching this and everything. Uh, Tim is cosplaying as Max Headroom. Is what he <laughs> said. <laughs> what is your background? Um, YouTube Punk was asking earlier. What's your background? I can't remember. You can't remember. <laughs> well, I did the. Uh... Last time, what is it? It looks, I don't know, like uh, sci-fi room? Yeah. Spaceship? Let me see what it says. Inside? I got to remember myself. Okay, well, we'll figure it out. All or something it was. Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> doesn't matter well hey thanks for joining me tim it's always good talking with you hopefully we'll get hopefully I'll actually talk with you more um because like i said we kind of we kind of lost touch there over the holidays we were both so busy i know just trying to get things done and everything you had to work a lot of that didn't you 
Oh yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, so we we weren't able to to touch base a lot, and so uh, hopefully you know within a year we'll be able to do that a little bit more. Hopefully at some point you'll be able to be back over here with me. Um, you know, trying and COVID cases are spiking right now, and so you, we even have Olivia still home from school. Hopefully we can send her back in February though, once things kind of die down. So we'll see. But anyway, thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. It's good to have you here. Good talking with y'all, and always good to just kind of have some you know some uh hangout time with tim and and talk arcade games right bud yeah all the time sounds good well everybody take care have a good night we'll see you in february for the live show and uh, if you have any questions till then questions at arcade repair tips.com is the way to get a hold of us and we'll see you in february for the next live show take care everybody night <laughs>